Transport Infrastructure Ireland. Um, and I'm going to try and keep this in time. We're starting reasonably on time. We have a lot of stuff to crack through before lunchtime, so we won't delay with it. Um, as I say, in Pascal Griffin, we have the core team that were involved here. Well, some of the core team with us. We have Aidan Cray here from Cork County Council on the left, and Stephen Barry from Arup, and Charlie Carr, who uh, you'll, you'll meet them all during the course of the day. We have one man missing. His wife had a baby boy there on Friday, so he's on the missing list for a while. So he'll be busy and sleepless, I'm sure. Um, what I'm going to do is just introduce this and a little bit of background of where, of where we came from and hand over the heavy lifting then to the, to the guys to go through the actual detail. So um, why the documents were required? I suppose this is the latest iteration, if you want to look at it like that, in terms of our temporary traffic management documents. Um, those of us who were old enough, um, the elder lemons amongst us, and looking around, I'm one of the elder of the elder lemons, would remember the old city and county engineers document that we had in the 80s when I was inside in the early 80s. That's what we had was an old blue, one blue booklet, city and county engineers, and amongst amongst the equipment listed in there were the old tar barrels painted red and white. So things have moved on a little bit since the 80s. Then we had 96, we had the, the first chapter 8 in the temporary... Tra temporary traffic management in the traffic signs manual and um, subsequent iterations then in 2010 well I suppose 2006 there was a launch of the first chapter 8 current version of the chapter 8 as a pilot then we had a 2008 proper launch of that and update in 2010 and stitched in between those then were the, the um, design documents the two versions of the Ashburn document so um, what we have now is a revision, really, of that Ashburn document in the form of the design document, revision of Chapter 8, which is the core document, and then we've added the operations document, which I'll, I'll get into. Um, so basically, that's just an overview up there of what, what I'm going to go through, and we we'll go through it in, in um, logically, I suppose, step by step. So just by way of overview, our road network in Ireland is about 90, 99,000 kilometers of road, national and non-national. About 53,000 of that is national. Um, and as you know, we have a huge variance in road types, and it's one of the problems we encountered with the existing Chapter 8, is that certain elements were done well, and certain elements not covered so comprehensively, and there were deficiencies there that we tried to address in this latest iteration of the documents. Um, Things are getting busier out there as well. We have a 30% increase in traffic on the national road network since 2010, and that's going up exponentially, really, in the last year or two. Um, and we also have a significant increase in the, in the number of roadworks. We went through a time there where we had no money to do anything bar a little bit of maintenance. So there's a lot going on at the moment. I suppose we have about, uh, ah, excuse me, we have about 5% um, of the network surface stressed every year and about 5% um, resurface. So you have about 10,000 kilometers of network being addressed every year just under that heading. And then you have all the major works and you have all the um, the, the uh, utilities out there as well. You have a lot of other operators besides road operators out on the road. So there's a lot of activity on our roadsides and it's important that we manage that well and that we have a safe and efficient manner of protecting the, the workers in the first instance and the road users in, in the other. So at the bottom there you can just see the cross-section of different road types that people have to deal with and that we try to address in these documents. Um, roads legislation, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail on that, except that again the ante has been upped. I think the first um, Safety, Health and Welfare Act, if I remember rightly, was around 95 and people started over the years becoming more interested in it and putting more emphasis on the whole issue of safety at work and safety on the roads. Um, so it's in that context as well that these documents form a very important base for what we do out there. Um, yeah, it's all, it's, it's all about road workers and road users, I suppose, to, to make sure that the road users are presented with a uniform layout in, for the various different types of road and the various different types of work um, and uniformity and consistency both in terms of traffic signs is very important but it's very important 
that the road that the road user identifies the type of markings that are out there, or the type of signing that's out there, and that that's consistent around the country. So the need for the operations document, um, which is the new document in the suite here, um, it's about, I think it's 2015 we started this and we came up with this idea of a suite of documents. Um, and there was a, a, a deficiency, I suppose, identified in the context of an operations guidance. There was no operations guidance for the guys who were out there on the road trying to deploy this stuff. So while we had nice pictures, of what the thing should look like during the course of the works. There was no guidance there as to how you get all this kit from the yard into the truck and safely out on the ground. So I suppose that's the, the gap that we were trying to fill in the context of the operations guidance. Um, yeah, so we did a position paper on it, I suppose, to try and identify these things and to listen to what people were saying to us and to try and identify a gap analysis, if you want to call it that, I suppose. Um, and hence the operations document. I don't think I'll say much more about that. The lads are going to fill it in as we go along, but that's basically um, what was the background to that. So we have these three documents now. Um, we have the core document, which is Chapter 8. and what you'll find with the three documents is they're, they're written for three different audiences. Chapter 8 is the core document. Sorry. Sorry, we started pretty promptly. We were trying to move along, so I'll give you a second there to, to get into position. So, Chapter 8, we, we tried to strip out anything that wasn't absolutely necessary in Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is more legalistically written than the others. Most of it is, is thou shall. Chapter 8 is the law of the land. It comes out under a direction of the minister and it's a thou shall obey this. Thou shall put these measures in place if you're out there on the, on the road. So it's written more legalistically and probably more concisely um, than the other two documents. The design document then, as the name suggests, is for the designer. So it's written I wouldn't like to say maybe at a higher level, but it's written at a different level to some of, to, to the um, to the operations guidance document. It's written for the designer, and then at the operations level, it's kind of targeted at the temporary traffic operations supervisor. So it's it's targeted at the level where guys can understand what we're trying to say. Um, so there's there's that thread through the three documents. Um. <coughs> As I said, I think it was 2015 where we had this, we, we've kind of been conscious for a long time, I suppose, that there were deficiencies had emerged since the 2010 traffic science manual. And we started to address it positively, positively in 2015. But to be honest, there wasn't a whole lot happening for a couple of years. And eventually we said, look, we have to dedicate a team to this or it's just not going to happen. None of us are going to get it done as a Sunday job. Um, so... We started, we, TII had um, a commission with Arabs on standards, so we started there and we, we commissioned Arab to take this on board. And then we bolstered Arab's input then with a team of Jerry Crowley, who's the man that's just out of the maternity ward, and Aidan here in front of us. And then we had subject matter experts in the form of Charlie Carr, who you'll meet later on, and Wolfgang Rice. Um, so Charlie has had a lot of experience in this. Charlie, for those of you who remember, probably came across him first in Donegal and later in the LSNTG in the whole area of training. And there's a lot of work done on the high-speed road stuff. So Charlie was, was, was hugely involved in all of that. Um, there was myself from TII, John McCarthy from um, the department, chaired a lot of the meetings or chaired all of the meetings virtually. Um, and then we were very conscious that we would get input from the people on the ground who were having the problems. So I suppose, broadly speaking, the cities had a lot of issues, which you'll hear about later on. So we, we pulled in a lot of expertise there from, in particular, Dublin City and Cork City as to the issues that they were having and trying to address those. The rurals, rural single carriageways in particular were also problematic in a couple of key areas. So we had a lot of input from a number of the local authorities was Kerry and Kildare and Wicklow and Loud, I think, in particular. And um, 
Then we had input from the industry from CIF. Danny Murphy was a representative there from Highway Markings from the CIF. And then for, at the higher level roads, the high speed roads, we engaged assistance from uh, or input from the MARC contracts, motorway maintenance and renewals contracts, contracts, and the PPP contractors, the guys who are out there all day every day maintaining the high speed road network. So we kind of got input from all the various stakeholders, to use that term. Um, we had quite a number of technically working group meetings, of 70 there, I'd say that's probably conservative. We've put a lot of time and effort in a lot of conference calling and um, a lot of iterations in the thing and a lot of agonizing over stuff and some days you'd come out and wonder what have we achieved at all, having spent the day talking about one particular paragraph or something. But anyway, we got there. Um, and then to mention the Health and Safety Authority have been instrumental in, throughout it all. We have been in contact with the HSA and they've given us a lot of good input, as have Solace. So we've had a lot of stakeholders in the whole thing. Um, the operations, guidance requirements, um, as I said, there wasn't much guidance there by way of how you get all this kit from the yard onto the truck and off the truck in a safe manner. And you know, simple things like what end of a table do you start putting it on, what order of installation do you have, how do you maintain it, how do you remove it, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's how the TTOS implements the plan um, and then giving safe operating methodologies and standardized systems. So even guidance on, you know, what side of you, you carry the sign on, being able to look at oncoming traffic, giving people some kind of a mechanism to determine whether it was safe to cross the road or not, you know, giving them counts of time to try and identify suitably safe gaps to cross the road, trying to minimize obviously crossing the road where you're at maximum exposure and things as simple as walk, don't run, that, that kind of stuff. Um, chapter 8 then, um, we had a, a number of issues which were picked up along the way as we went and we were trying to, 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 to plug the gaps there for the people who were having the particular problems with it. Um, I suppose it's fair to say that the high speed, road, high speed roads network was probably better dealt with than the lower speed roads. Um, most of the problems really were in the single carriageway rurals and the urban areas. Uh, the high speed stuff, easier to deal with in a, in a design document because it's a designed road, it's a designed network. So you have standard diesel lanes, axle lanes, junction layouts, all of that is standardized. And therefore it's much easier to give you a standardized layout for your temporary traffic management as well. Um, the, the legacy roads, problematic because of sight distance and most problematic where they become very narrow, where you don't have room to give yourself proper lateral safety zones and all of that kind of stuff without blocking the road or closing the road and that's not always easy to do either. So people were between a rock and a hard place there in a, in a number of um, scenarios and the urbans then we had the same thing where a lot of the layouts would be more suitable to rural areas and when you try and put out that level of signage in an urban area you discover you've gone back three or four junctions and it's it's just unworkable or un, unrealistic to put out huge levels of signage um, so we kind of built off the practices that had been built up in Cork and Dublin in particular to try and give better guidance on that. Um, the roadworks classifications, there were six in the old document. Uh, most, you know, they, they, they weren't all used and in some instances it was a little bit puzzling as to why they were there in the first instance because some of them arrived at the same signage layouts for the two different levels. So there was a little bit of inconsistency going on there. So we rationalized that down to three, which the lads were going to. And we also, there were three types. There are still three types, but the definitions of the types have been changed quite significantly. Um, type B in particular wasn't very effective or wasn't very well used as a result. So I let the lads get into all of that, but we did keep the three types. We were going to think about renaming them so as to avoid confusion with the old type A, B and C, but we decided that would only cause further confusion. So they're still type A, B and C, but the definitions of them are different. Um, there was another, semi-static operations weren't well de dealt with in urban sites. 
um, and, and bits and pieces of other stuff that we picked up as we went along the way. Um, just on the, in terms of standards, it's worth noting, I suppose, that in the urbans in particular, um, since 2010, Deemers was published. And Deemers uses much tighter sight distances um, and lead-ins than the DMRB. So we availed of that, I suppose, to try and put more rational and reasonable and workable solutions in place in the urban areas. So we aligned the standards in the urban areas with DEMERS and we aligned the, the standards for the others, which had been broadly done before, I suppose, but we, we tweaked them um, in the context of the DMRB standards. So there's an alignment across the temporary traffic management arrangements and the permanent arrangements. Um, Worth noting as well, and in the in the urban areas, with there was a particular emphasis which there wasn't there before on the vulnerable road users. Like we were, I suppose, too concerned before about traffic and getting traffic through an area. So the emphasis is changed entirely on the urban side now, where the emphasis is now focused on the pedestrians and the cyclists in particular, and the cars not quite play a second fiddle, but they're. The, the, the emphasis is really on the, the pedestrians and cyclists. So there's a lot more guidance there now. You see on the bottom right there, you know, guiding people safely and corralling them in instances that they don't fall into holes or fall out in front of trucks. So to provide safe passage through or around the works. Um, there were other things in the urbans that, I, again, the lads are going to deal with, but multi-lane streets wasn't covered at all. Um, urban dual carriageways precious little on it, semi-static operations in urbans that we have a lot of detail on, on that now that wasn't there before. Um, and the risk-based approach uh, permeates the entirety of the documents. Um, it's a risky place to be, it's a risky place to put out traffic management, so there's no point putting people at risk unnecessarily. So you have to balance the risks of what you're trying to do, how long you're going to be out there, with the risk in putting out the temporary traffic management and that's I suppose that's a very important thread throughout the documents and throughout the whole thing is that um, it's risk based and bottom line is if you come across a situation that's not entirely dealed, dealt with in the documents it gives you some kind of a methodology for following it so assessing your risk and mitigating the risk um, the lads are going to go into a lot more detail on that, but risk is something that's 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 much more prominent in these documents than it was previously. And on-site risk assessments, dynamic risk assessments, go through the whole thing, and it's, it's mentioned umpteen times throughout the documents. Um, rural road network. There's a couple of sketches there on the side, or a couple of photographs about the types of issues that are were problematic. Again, on the design network, there wasn't a great issue on the rural improved rural single carriageways, no great issues there. It's on these legacy type roads, the narrow roads where you have the guy cleaning the drains there on the, on the bottom right. Those type of issues um, and semi-static operations on wide singles wasn't very well dealt with either. So we picked up those type of issues and um, there's a lot more there hopefully of help than there was there previously. Um, the minor roads I mentioned. Yeah, move on. Um, High speed network, as I said, it's a design network. There was a lot of good work done um, in the development by the LSNTG and Charlie and myself were involved in that in developing training courses for the high speed roads. So there were some stuff there that went slightly outside of the chapter eight as it was. So what we've basically done there is we've tweaked chapter eight in the context of the, the stuff that we put into and developed during the high speed roads courses and then picking up best practice from the UK and elsewhere, things like the lead-in taper has changed, it's shortened, and we have this Christmas tree type arrangement with tra transverse cones on it. Um, the lads are going to get into the detail on that, but the lead-in tapers are changed. Lane mergers, narrow lanes weren't particularly well detailed, so there's a lot of guidance there now that there wasn't previously. Um, and we made some minor enough changes to warning signage in terms of size, material, and retroreflectivity. Um, so we're using um, 
what you call that stuff, the fluorescent, the fluorescent um, signs, which are a lot more conspicuous. When we were developing these, we did site trials at night, and I have to say thank you to our mark contractors for helping us out there. And we had Fraser helping us out with the with these type of issues. The guys who were out there on the road recognize the problems that they were having, so we tried to address those during this exercise. So we did a lot of useful um, work on site at night in particular with different scenarios and we, we tricked around with the trailers and the spacing of the trailers and the mobile lane closures and we made some tweaks there so um it took a while but there was a i think it's it's definitely it was definitely beneficial to go out on site and to, to trial the various ideas that we had we had a few ideas that we thought would be good ideas and when we went out on the site they turned out not to be so great after all um, so again, design. There's there's guidance on hard shoulder running, direct lane closures, narrow lane systems. Um, I won't say any more about that. The boys will pick all that up. So here we are. We have a set of three documents, three a suite of three documents, um, as I described. Or maybe I'll just jump on and say we have one copy for everyone in the audience. I'm afraid it is all we have. Or for every sorry, <laughs> sorry, thanks, Aidan. For every organisation, yeah. Um, I suppose we've taken the policy decision this time that we haven't printed a whole dose of documents. We did it before with the chapter, and we did it with the traffic signs manual actually, and there were buckets of them dumped uh, later on because we we over egged it entirely. Um, so this time we kind of went with the American system, really, where partially because it's a dynamic document, and we want to be able to update it relatively readily so really what we're saying to people at this, at this point is that they're available on the website and if you go to the website you'll get the most up-to-date version of it at any one time and you can print it yourself or you can send a PDF to printing I understand if you send the PDF for printing you get a, a suite of documents something like that for about 15 quid or something like that so they're, they're not unreasonably expensive you can also pick the section that you're interested in obviously and just print that and bring it off out in sight with you as many times as you want so like it's it's more dynamic and it's it's more manageable in the long term than printing off bucket loads of or lorry loads of, of um, folders and trying to store them and trying to post them and courier them and all of that so we, we, we went away from all that and we moved into the modern age and um, we're going digital so as I say there's Donald O'Connor there at the back from DTAS has one copy for every organization in the audience. Um, transitional arrangements and I'm starting to come under pressure here for time there's a transition period with these until for nine months after they were published there for, for until the 1st of June 2020 and during that period you may use the old or the new standard but not to mix the two we want to be consistent in the message we give so you can't combine the two different chapter eights on the one site and after 2020 we really want to move away from the old standard but you can still use it on on roads of where works were tendered are underway this year with the approval of the road authority in the first instance and if it's a national road with our TII approval so we, we did allow for that just to avoid to be honest contractual claims and fellas pouncing around with it we just wanted to be clear that, that um, we don't want fellas playing games with that so um, there is a provision there to retain the <coughs> implementation obviously there's a lot of training will be required for all of this and that's going to be dealt with later in the day and people like ourselves in TII who have standard operating procedures like we have our dashboard manuals for our signing and delineation and a lot of the local authorities would have standard operating procedures for various things even gully cleaning and all the various routine operations uh, so those are going to have to be updated by each of the organizations ourselves included on the basis of the new documents. Acknowledgements, John, I suppose John McCarthy has moved on from his position in the department, but John put a lot of time and effort into it. Um, Donald is up at the back there from DTAS. Um, we have a DTAS support office in NACE, and then the, the boys, the core team that I mentioned before, the two guys from Cork County Council, Stephen from Arup, um, Charlie Wolfgang, Jerry O'Brien, who a lot of you will know XTII um, was our overall mentor and uh, kept us on the straight and narrow 
and then the various local authorities, the HSA particularly, um, Solace and the Construction Industry Federation. And I mentioned before the MARC contractors and the PPP people on the nationals and the privates. So thank you. And lost a couple of minutes over. I'm not doing too bad. So thank you very much for your attention. Hi, how are you all doing? Um, my name's Charlie Kerr, and just uh, I worked on the project team there along with the along with the lads and Pascal on the development of the documents. So I'm just going to give a talk now, and then we'll break for a, a cup of tea. Um, but we're going to break the talk into three parts. I'm going to talk about Chapter Eight. Aidan is going to talk about the design document, and Stephen's going to talk about the operations document. So in terms of uh, Chapter Eight, just to understand that Chapter Eight is the ministerial direction. It's, it's, it constitutes a, a road traffic regulation. Um, so that prescribes what measures can be used or should be, can be used on the road in terms of the signage and, what, and, and how they are to be implemented on the road. So no other signs or devices are to be used on a road work site other than what is prescribed in Chapter 8. So if we look at the suite of documents, what we have is we have the ministerial direction, which is Chapter 8. We have the um, design guidance document, which gives guidance to people who are managing, controlling, and designing traffic management about how to implement the standards set out in Chapter 8. And then finally, we have the operations guidance document, which, which gives directions and uh, method, methodology for installing, modifying, and removing those devices. So uh, the guidance documents can be, let's say, uh, more graphical or um, more fluid in how they describe things, talk about edge cases and things like that, whereas Chapter 8 is very much a prescription, as Pascal says. Um, it's, it's, it sets what the, what the rules are. So when you open each of the documents, in the first page of each of the documents, this Chapter 8 there, you'll be uh, given this page here, which will effectively indicate where you are. Um, so uh, in this case here in the open chapter, it'll tell you you're, you're at the introduction stage and then it will give you how those correlate to other sections across the document and we'll explain as we go through the talk how the different sections of the document uh, interact with one another. But importantly, one thing to maybe to understand is the use of terminology within the documents. A lot of the times we have uh, use of the word shall, we have use of the word should and we have use of the word may. Now, believe it or not, at times there was big debates over which of those words should be used for any particular requirement. And just to understand what each of those words mean, shall obviously means that you must do it. There is no choice. This is what you must do. May obviously means that it's optional. And then should is a recommendation. But sometimes people maybe can uh, have a fluid understanding of what that word should actually means. And my best description to you about what the word should means is should means you should unless you shouldn't. Now, that means that if you have a valid reason for not doing something, and a valid reason means it would create some other hazard or would create some other problem, not the fact that, oh, I don't have it or I couldn't be bothered. That's not a reason not to do it. But if there's a valid reason for you not to do something, then that's perfectly all right. You can use that support. That's understandable. That's why the term should was chosen for that particular requirement. So as Pascal st states right throughout the document, if I was going to define what's different from the old document versus what's in the new chapter 8, it, it is this concept of it's risk driven. It's a, it's a risk based approach. The old chapter 8 was very much a design document. It was based on design standards. Now that meant some, uh, as Pascal says, some um, absurd results. For example, if you were doing a, a, a works in a housing estate, in a quiet housing estate at 30 kilometers per hour, you would end up with the same result as working in the Keys in Dublin at 30 kilometers per hour because it was based on the design speed of the road. So you're coming up with the same result, but obviously the two risk, uh, the, what was driving the risk in both locations was completely different. So with that in mind, the old chapter eight had six design standards, but now what we actually did in the new chapter eight, and there was quite a bit of time up front spent on trying to figure this out, uh, was we, we broke that down into three risk levels or risk, uh, risk methodologies. So we have a level one road, which is basically uh, an urban road. We have level two roads, which are rural roads, and then level three roads, which is high speed 
uh, dual carriageways. And just to explain uh, how that ended up, what's driving the risk in urban areas, as Pascal has said, isn't so much the speed of the traffic. What's actually driving the risk in most cases is the pre presence and the volume of vulnerable road users, that's pedestrians and cyclists, the presence of large amounts of traffic, very restricted geometry and very close junctions, restricted vision, uh, a lot of vehicle maneuvers in and out of, let's say, business premises, commercial premises and things like that, and that includes both uh, vulnerable road users and traffic. So it's those sorts of things that are driving the risks in urban areas. When we move out to rural areas, what's driving the risk is predominantly speed and visibility. Okay, a lot of the network, as Pascal says, is, is what we call a legacy type network, which means that they were never designed. They, they, they evolved from the horse and cart. So a lot of times out in, the, out in the network, speed and visibility is what's driving the risk in level two roads. When we move on to level three roads, and I'm looking at Fraser up there, I'm sure he'll attest to that, most of the risks are driven back to road user behavior because we are in fully designed environments. And what happens is people effectively, when they get onto those sorts of networks, they don't really want to stop and they'll do anything in their power or anything that they can see possible that will make sure that they don't stop or, 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 or slow down, including an unusual thing, or maybe not that unusual, but when they see roadworks ahead sign, they could speed up to get in front of something that may slow them down, maybe a kilometre up the road. So it's road user behaviour is really driving the risks on level three roads. So the, the, so the six levels was effectively rationalised down to three levels because those are the profiles. And when we talk about the documents, you will see that when we get to the design guidance document and the operations guidance document, it breaks the it goes into four parts, and the, and the re reason for that is we have part zero, which is effective to general health and safety, which Ashton and Michael McDonough there from the HSA were very much involved in drafting that part of it. Um, it also gives general requirements on traffic management. But then part one, part one of those two documents relates to the level one roads. Part two relates to the level two roads. And part three relates to the level three roads. So if you're working in a particular organization, dealing with a particular uh, type of road, I know the M50 is here somewhere as well, that we that you would be effectively using chapter eight, part three of the, part zero and part three of the operations, and part zero and part three of the design. So it's, it's to try and make the thing much easier and more, um, more targeted to use. Now just to understand then, as we break down those further levels, obviously those levels are subdivided, but really and truly, that subdivision, all it's really doing in those cases there is it's, it's, it's uh, determining the number of signs or the amount of visibility that you require. Still, the way that the risk is managed is still the same. It's still categorized into those three levels, but we'll be going into the tables and that in just a bit. Uh, so as I said, level one is urban roads, level two is rural roads, and level three is high-speed dual carriages. So then when we look at the types of traffic management, as Pascal says, there was an old type B. And please, if anybody's leaving here today, one thing definitely remember is uh, the old type C isn't this type C, the old type C is now type B. Now, we tried renaming it and we're using different terminology, but it came back that we were kind of stuck with this terminology for training purposes and, and many other per, for many other reasons. But in effect, we, we're still using the same terminology, but just be careful as of now and the transition that we don't confuse those terms. So what we have is static type A, which is uh, uh, traffic use in all traffic conditions, and we're just going to skip straight down to, to type B and type C. What you will notice now is this traffic flow column. Now, this risk-based approach means that traffic flow now becomes a central pillar of the risk assessment for each type of traffic that we do. Before now, it would have been visibility and speed, but now equally in that mix is traffic volume because obviously the volume of traffic, whether it be vehicle traffic, pedestrian traffic, whatever, is what's driving the risk. It's a core contributor to what risk you're dealing with. So you'll see that that's, that's front and central of every uh, assessment or every process that we do is, is assessing the traffic. And Stephen in particular, when he goes through his talk, will be, will be indicating that. So uh, in effect, once traffic gets above, above what we call a saturated figure, or, or full, full capacity, really and truly the only option available to you is type A works, which is effectively full-blown traffic management here, where you throw out all the devices and you, and, you, and you install all the different measures to keep the site safe because the risk has been driven up at that stage. 
Whereas when we get to uh, static type B, the risk is lower, the traffic is lower. You'll also see there that the time exposure is lower. It's less than 12 hours that was left open. And the old type C, it was short-term works. Some people define that as an hour. Some people define that as a day. Some people define that as a week, depending on could you make it suit your site? What longitudinal safety zone could you stick in? Whereas now it's, it's, it's defined by time, less than 12 hours, and <coughs> within the traffic capacity. Now, static type C, I'll be going on to that in just a, a little bit. Static type C is a new type of road work. In effect, what you're actually doing here is you're not installing traffic management devices. Now, you may be you're still using the roadworks ahead side, you may be still using the blue arrow to indicate that there, there are works taking place. But because they're uh, short duration, because they're discrete locations, and I'm going to be very careful about that in the next slide, we are talking about what is measurable low-risk work. And because you're going to be there for less than 15 minutes, and, and as we said, we take this risk-based approach, and Pat, Pascal alluded to this as well, everything that we do on the road is, has risk associated with it. Every cone we put up, every sign we put up has a risk. It's a risk, first of all, that it presents itself to the road user, and also there's a risk to the road worker who has to put it up and then take it down again. So when we balance those two time periods and the, and the level of risk that's actually been dealt with, in low-risk situations, when you're going to be there short enough, it's better off just get the job done because you'll be there longer with the same exposure of risk and putting up the devices. That's the balancing act, but you see that that's very tightly controlled in the next slide. Semi-static operations, again, tighter control. You'll see there the very much traffic flow comes in there, and Aidan will be talking about that. And then mobile lane closures, uh, not much difference there, to be honest. Um, they, they were well enough defined in the previous document. So straight away, type C works, just to explain what this is. So this is where we're not actually putting up devices. Now, we're still putting up that road, we still have that road works ahead sign, we still have the blue arrow, we still have our flashing beacons and stuff in operation. But in order to assess that, it's a once-off discrete location. Now that specifically means if I have a pothole here and it takes me 10 minutes to fix that pothole and then I have another pothole over there and it takes me 10 minutes to fix that pothole, that they are not discrete locations. That's described in the, in, the, in the design document. Discrete locations is where you mobilize to a site, you do your work less than 15 minutes and then you demobilize off the site again. The whole plant moves off the site again. So that's the definition of what discrete means. So you're there once off. Uh, uh, once off for, for 15 minutes. You were there for less than 15 minutes. The traffic is less than capacity. You see, that's going to be a theme running through this morning. And then we do a site assessment. That site assessment consists of, first of all, where are you going to park your vehicle? Are you going to park it off the carriage, park it in a parking bay, or park it in a live lane? And if you are parking in a live lane, you must park it legally. So that means all those conditions there, not in double yellow lines, not within five meters of a junction, etc., etc. Now you will see, or hopefully know, that this effectively is what everybody else is allowed to park the vehicle, because that's the rules of the road. They're the only places you're allowed to park a vehicle. So, so you're, you're effectively complying with the rules of the road. However, the fact that we're actually doing work means the duty of care on us, because we're working on the road, is a little bit higher than it would be for the standard road user. And because of that, there's an additional assessment that we've introduced um, for visibility. So depending on the speed of the road, that you require these visibilities so that approaching traffic can see your vehicle and see past your vehicle. So, uh, um, th so that's uh, 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 let's say the, the the bar being raised slightly because we are uh, because we're actually carrying works out on the carriage uh, out on the road. And the last thing is where is the road worker actually going to be positioned? So. If he's not, the, the road worker must effectively not be creating a hazard themselves. So this case here, we see that this list means that the vehicle, by definition of the Roads Act, is not creating a hazard. And now this list here is making sure that the road worker is not creating a hazard. Okay? So the road worker is not in a live lane. And if they are in a live lane that they're protected by a fan, and just maybe to explain what that means, in this particular photograph here, this is a Type C operation. This is a once-off, the gully was reported blocked. It's a once-off clean, jumped out of the truck. He's going to clean that gully. He's, he's standing on the footway. The beacons are in operation. He has his lights on. There's a roadworks ahead side on the far side. And we have this dashed lines, plenty of visibility. It's a 50 kilometer an hour zone. He's parked in the night lane. So the road worker does this particular instance satisfies all those requirements as a type C works. Now, we have this also fend 
parking. Now, fend parking is not impact protection. Fend parking effectively means that the vehicle is deflecting traffic away from the worker. That's what a fend means. It's not impact protection. And there's specific um, requirements given for fend parking within the documents. But in effect, in summary, if that road worker was standing anywhere between two meters and five meters ahead of the truck, probably in this zone here. So let's say, for example, the gully was here. The road worker would also be perfectly uh, legitimate for that work, road worker to be standing there cleaning the gully because any traffic coming that would not present the hazard to that road worker. Beyond that five meter distance, yes, the traffic would now be pulling back into the road worker and therefore he's not allowed to be there. He would be considered as presenting a hazard to traffic. Now you see that's in the urban area. When we move out to the rural area, risk-based approach means we've now got speed and visibility is now becoming an issue. So you'll see here that there's an additional requirement here we're not in the live lane but now we're not within 1.5 meters of the live lane and again again looking at the risks looking at accident data uh, across europe we we know that at, at around 1.2 but certainly be heading to 1.5 off the off the carriageway the accident rates really drop off the edge of a cliff so what this is doing is making sure it's this has been deliberate to make sure that these are only applied in low risk situations so where this would not apply in for example would be a, a telecom type operation where somebody was running up at the, the pole at the side of the road. So that would not come under type C works. So if the pole was as, as within 1.5 meters of the side of the road, or the ladder being used as, as within 1.5 meters of the side of the road, then we cannot use type C. You need traffic management and in those instances to carry out that work. Uh, likewise, if they were on the on the footway or protected by a fan, they could, uh, the same thing applies. So, if we look at uh, level one one roads, and that's how these are these are, that's how you these are named. They're level one one roads. You can see here it's uh, for 30 kilometres per hour. Now, just to understand, we'll take this risk-based approach. Just to explain how these figures are, uh, arise. At. Now, these tables should be somewhat familiar to you. There may be some new areas, like for example, Lane Watts and some of these number of signs under the advanced signage uh, conditions. But uh, by and large, it's a very similar format to the old to the old style. But just to explain where some of these numbers are coming using the risk-based approach. If I was to take my go back to my example of my housing estate, 30 kilometers per hour. Who's in that housing estate? Well, we have local people. Probably most of the traffic is going to be local traffic. There may be uh, elderly people using the footpath. There may be kids out on bikes. And we come along and we apply the old chapter 8. The old chapter 8 would kind of come along and say, well, you know, you need three signs. It needs to be 75 metres away from the road. You need to be put in a 50 metre longitudinal safety zone there. Uh, you need to make sure that you have your 50 metre visibility around the signs. So th what's happening is, if I was working at a manhole, I would be taking a very local and low-risk site and I'll be spreading that risk right throughout the housing estate, taking into account all those junctions and other things. So these signs that I put out, obviously it's going to take time. There's hazards associated with putting them out. But also, if those signs are still up, the, the child who's cycling along that road, and the next thing he has th three signs, or she has three signs to cycle out and around, so you're deflecting them out into danger. So all these things are dangerous. I'm using barriers. I'm spreading the barriers up over 15 meters. I've now blocked Mrs. Jones going over to Mrs. Murphy for her morning coffee. All these things are interfering with how that, that's, that housing estate would normally work for what would be a low risk type activity when I'm just working at this manhole. So taking that approach, what we're saying is when something is low risk and when it's concentrated in, in such an area, and 30 kilometers an hour, by the way, is, is, is in most cases, level one, one roads, low risk environments. We see that the well, first thing we've done is we've reduced the size of the site from 600 down to 450 because these sites are generally quite restrictive in terms of what dimensions are available to you. So they've been reduced down to 450. This, the uh, visibility of the site reduced to 25. Now look here, we've reduced that three signs for a type B works less than 12 hours down to one sign. That means specifically the road works ahead sign. It's put 10 meters away from the work and your longitudinal safety zone is half a meter and the, that's that whole drive is to make sure that everything that needs to be there is there but we pull it to where it's needed don't be spreading it out elsewhere where all you're doing is creating other hazards and you're negating the fact that that, uh, that you put on these devices in the first place so that's a big impact there and housing estate <coughs> housing estate type environments so as you see we have the parameters there down the left hand side as they always were which outlined the signage the cones the lamps and then we have up at the top 
we have the types. So depending on the thing. Now you see here for type C, just to understand, these are obviously left blank because in type C, we're at, remember, we're not actually putting in arrangements. We make sure that that visibility, as we described, is still there, but we're not actually putting in arrangements because type C is strictly confined to those low risk, low, uh, low exposure to risk uh, sites. So uh, if I move on, to, or that's uh, less than 30 kilometers. So then at 40 kilometers an hour, you'll see that these parameters starting up. We can still use a smaller sign, but now we're into two signs for type B works. The visibility required is going up, and the cumulative, the cumulative distance required is going up. We still have this half a meter longitude and safe zone. But let's move on to Main Street. Main Street's generally 50 kilometers per hour. Now, again, we, because of that, the risks are now increasing. We're up at 600 millimeter signs. Uh, 50 meter sign visibility, but only two signs now, and a 40 meter as opposed to a 50 meter cumulative distance. And at all times, we're using a 5 meter rather than a 15 meter longitudinal safety zone. Again, we don't be spreading the stuff over and creating secondary hazards because of our traffic management. Moving then on to level 1 4 roads, we have 600 millimeter signs. Now, the risks are starting to get up into DMRB territory rather than DMRS territory. At this stage, the risks are really getting up, uh, up high. Uh, for urban environments, but in this case here, so we're throwing more at it. There's 60 meter sign visibility. We're still using two signs, um, but you see here that we have that 15 meter cumulative distance now at this stage. The other thing just to bear in mind is that this also, this level also applies to multi lanes or duels that are less than 60 kilometers per hour. It's an important distinction there. That means that even though the keys in Dublin are 30 kilometers per hour. They come under level one four roads. So they're distinct from this first column that I looked at. They're level one four roads, which means it has all those additional higher levels of, of devices and higher level of protection there because the risks from traffic at those locations are much higher. So that's why they, they fall into the, uh, level one four roads. Moving on to, sorry. Moving on to level two roads, um, for two one and two two, just to, supposed to explain some of the difference here. Again, substantial difference here for I'm, going, I'm just going to concentrate on type B works for the works that I'm, I'm taken uh, as a shift a work shift. These this would have been 600 meters, uh, 200 meter distance between the signs and 120 meters visibility. That's now been um, rationalized again on the same basis of a risk based approach because these networks are generally the lower speed roads. It could be a region network, could be local local primaries, local local road network. But again, we were spreading the signs possibly up to a kilometer away from where the works were. And all again, numbers of junctions stuff, every junction needs a sign. So we're spreading all that risk around. We're, 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 we're spreading those risks across our network. So this was just designed to bring the stuff into where it's needed. That's perfectly adequate. That's more than adequate with the factor of safety uh, for warning road users about the forthcoming works. So 360 meters as opposed to 600. And then we all, at all times using a 45 meter longitude and safety zone. So remember, it's speed and visibility is a risk here. So we need those bigger buffers to protect our workforce in those locations. Now, when we get to 100 kilometers per hour, let's call a spade a spade. 100 kilometers per hour is probably the most dangerous category in its entirety for the road worker to be working on a single carriageway road because a lot of these roads are legacy type roads. Again, the newer network, yes, they're designed. Uh, you, have, you have the space, you have the visibility, but certainly for the old legacy type roads, it's one of the riskiest environments for the road worker to be working in. And at that stage here, we're now in full blown. We're throwing all the horses at this particular thing here. So we have up at 60 meters uh, longitudinal safety zone. We have 120 meters visibility, and we're, we are up at 600 and up at 800 cumulative distance coming towards those works. So that's getting the full blown treatment to manage the risks associated with those types of those types of um, roads. Level three roads. This is 80 kilometers an hour and upwards. If something was 60 kilometers per hour, it falls into my level one four roads as I described earlier. But when we get out to the 80 kilometers an hour roads, you see here that these are effectively replicating the uh, 80 kilometer an hour um, single single carriage roads, except the sign size is larger. And we're putting signs on both sides of the roads. I'm going to explain that footnote in just a bit, but we're putting signs on both sides of the carriage. And that's a principle that's carried out, and Aidan will be talking more about that. We still have the same longitude and safety zone. And then for 100 and 120, these effectively, as, as they always were, 1.2 signs, 160 visibility, 800 and, uh, a kilometer approach for type B works. Now, the footnote there, what that relates to is for type B works, there's certain relaxations, and particularly like with the experience of the M50 operators, M50 concessions. 
Um, we're, we knew that at certain times or for certain operations, it's not credible to be asking people to have to put signs in the central median. So again, for type B works, there are certain relaxations, and Aidan will be going into that, whereby you can do straight tapers or you can uh, don't have to put up signs in the central median. And that's in effect what that footnote is meaning. But where, where that is instigated, there is an additional sign put up on the verge side. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start pressing the button because this thing seems to work sometimes and not work other times. So moving on then to the to some of the other changes in terms of the in terms of the signs. Um, first thing is that uh, as Pascal says, there was a lot, a lot of uh, trials, a lot, a lot of uh, different signs printed and different materials printed and things to get there. So what we have is we've revised the arrowhead because the old arrowhead uh, from certainly from a distance. Uh, had a, had problems uh, in terms of how it was perceived by the road user and at a distance that they would even perceive that it was an arrow. So these have been revised to make the, the arrowhead more pronounced and more distinguished uh, at a distance. The arrowhead has changed. This was a, a <laughs> many, many attempts made at trying to redesign the site access sign. Um, it was probably one of the most misused signs on all roadworks sites across the country. Most people were using it as a roadworks to the left or roadworks to the right. Um, but now we tried ambulances, we tried different versions of trucks and stuff, but at the end up we just had to give up and say, listen, we'll just stick down text, site access, it does what it says on the on the tin. All right, so it's a site access sign is now used, and, and that's not really an issue, uh, because obviously we, we like to keep things graphical, but that, that site access is mostly used by people who are, access, or who are working on the site of where to come in, where to go out. Um, so it's not it's not that big an issue. Obviously, Pascal says a lot more emphasis now put on vulnerable road users, including cyclists. So there's been new signage introduced to accommodate the new measures that are required for cyclists. So we have cycle direction signs uh, for a first time installed in. And also, again, arising from the same review, vulnerable road users, we have these pedestrian crossing signs included. And Aidan will be talking about where they should be used. Likewise, a lot of signs, a lot of signs had a lot of text in them, and we we're talking about X heights and things you got there. We could see the sign sizes were getting big, but more than that, once text went above a certain volume on the sign, the road user effectively wasn't looking at the sign anymore. They just couldn't understand well, what this it took too much time to look at the sign to comprehend what was on. So again, text very much rationalized on the sign. So for example, follow convoy vehicle. I think this used to be. So now we just have follow me, which is a an instruction to the road user and likewise with the supplementary plates we can see there that those have all been rationalized again trying to again for two two benefits there the x heights and the space that it takes up to sit below either the square sign which we'll talk about in a second or the diamond sign is much smaller now and likewise from a road user's perspective rather than having to read a sentence to understand what the supplementary plate meant they can now clearly see what the what the instruction of the supplementary plate does we have new merge to the right signs to do with how uh, different way the operations particularly on the marked networks merging traffic signs and then multiple uh, lane to the left lane to the right signs uh, introduced as well in terms of the new overtaking obviously one of the big things with an overtaking and i'm sure people have seen this multiple times where we have a no overtaking end sign placed right so alongside a, a solid white line so that was again a very very common problem so with one sign telling you people well you can overtake and yet the road marking which is the permanent marking was telling them they can't overtake. So in order to avoid that, in effect, all restrictions, with the exception of roadwork speed limit signs, are ended by the end sign. So you no longer need to use a road no overtaking end sign or a slippery surface end sign or any other end sign other than the road other than the roadwork speed limit. All those are now terminated by the roadworks end sign. The, as Pascal says, there was a lot, a lot of stuff, and to be fair to the to Mark contractors, they really drove this. We at the start we weren't that enthusiastic for taking it on, but they really drove this, and we're very, very glad that they did, um, because it really. I'll show you a photograph in just a second. It really did make a substantial difference to the signage on the Level Three network. So we have the square signs; they're not rectangular; they're square signs. We have the new arrowhead with the wicket board on it, and what that means is you get more real estate for the decal that's actually on the sign. When you have the diamond, you have to reduce the decal because of the diagonal, whereas it's square. For the same size of sign, you have more real estate to put the decal on. Now, those only apply to the 
to the uh, lane signs or the roadworks or the inform signs, I would say the roadworks ahead sign must still, because it's a legal requirement, it must still be diamond. So that first sign is still diamond. So all other signs are then square. And the other thing then is that, as Pascal says, for level three roads, not for level one or level two roads, level three roads, the mater backing material is fluorescent orange. Um, we don't have that in for level one and two roads because it's quite, it can be quite glary. And so if, if the headlights and the the vision, uh, the, 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 the point of vision is too much aligned, you'll find that there's a bit quite glary on the driver. So with the offsets on the level three roads, that's not an issue, so which is why we, we use uh, the fluorescent. So in terms of the trails, just to show you, that photograph there is not photoshopped in any fashion. But just to look at some of the things on that, you can see my mouse there. Uh, these are the old style signs, the diamonds. And then we have the, another diamond sign over here with the new fluorescent orange on it. But then just to point out that that sign from the point of view of that camera is actually the furthest away from the camera. Yet and all of all those signs is probably the clearest that's actually on display. So that's a combination of all those factors, the fluorescent orange, the new arrowhead, and the more the bigger real estate that's available on those square signs. So that's just a, a photograph of one of the trials that was carried out uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of those changes. Uh, obviously there's other new signage for narrow lane systems introduced as well. The, this sign obviously means that there's a narrow lane system ahead and, and this one is there's a narrow lane system in effect. So this gives you the detail up ahead. That means to, for a HGV driver, for example, change lane, whereas here you, you must be in your new lane, otherwise you're in breach of the road traffic regulations. New signage for mobile lane closures again, number uh, quite a number of trials on this. Of all the things I think we tried to crack, we tried to crack the advanced trailer boards and uh, we put our hand up, we say we just haven't got it cracked just yet, um, but it's, it is a lot better than what it was. Uh, I suppose we, we know that these mobile trailer boards are getting struck, um, but what we've tried to do is introduce methodologies whereby it would make First of all, uh, standardize the operation, and second of all, that, that would reduce the likelihood of that happening, obviously. So in terms of the new trailer board signage, again, the, this was what we call blind trialed as well. Believe it or not, with, in the old signs, the old diamond signs with the old arrowhead and the wicket, people actually did not understand what the wicket meant. They didn't understand that that meant that the lane ahead was closed. Um, so when we're doing blind trails and this new design it achieves a number of things. First of all, it's square, we get more real estate. Second of all, um, the, the Roadworks Ahead sign is on display, which means we're satisfying the legal requirements to display that sign. Third thing is, is that all the trailer boards are now the same, because that's the sign that's displayed in all trailer boards, whereas trailer board one used to have to display a slightly different configuration. And finally, from the road user's perspective, it's much more intuitive to them there in this instance that, well, actually there's works in lane one ahead. So there's a, I can understand that well, there's, there's something happening in lane one ahead. It's road works. So there's a, a number of uh, things from that perspective. The other thing in terms of lighting, what we've discovered was that there used to be a downlight specified here. That's been removed because it, it was detrimental. The, the fact that that downlight was there was detrimental to the performance of that retroreflectivity on that sign. So that downlight has actually been removed, and those signs are much more uh, effective now. And obviously, the, the, the daytime, nighttime running um, intensities of those lights are, are as they always were. The next thing that we were looked at was trying to rearrange these trailers. We tried it with two trailers. It was not a success. I think we can put our hand on our heart and say that. Uh, we tried it with different arrangements of trailers. And what we believe was happening, one of the things that was happening, I'm sure anybody doing mobile lane closures will, will attest to this, that when you have three trailers on the, on the, on the carriageway or on the, on the hard shoulder, one kilometer and the current 500 and the current 250, I believe what's happening is as, it, as the road user is passing that first sign, there's a, they get a, there's a rhythm, there's always a rhythm going, there's noises, there's rhythms going, and they go, da -dum, da -dum. then there's a trailer, and then suddenly the next trailer is half the time distance away that that, first, that, that second trailer appeared to them on. And it, in most cases what tends to happen is that road users automatically tend to drift out into lane two in spite of the fact that the traders are telling them, do not go into lane two. In spite of the fact that there's a big APV with a flashing beacon in them saying, do not come into lane two, stay in lane one. But yet and all, that maybe that, 
that little fright that they get or that irregular um, stacking that they get is pushing them out into. Into. So we tried that with the with this new arrangement, and the purpose of this is to try and regularise the distances between the traders that is more rhythmic, and they don't get that alarm as they're passing the signs. It's all subconscious. So um, now we didn't go for one kilometres and six sixty and three thirty because we're trying to be practical for the road for the operative using that because we have these marker boards and these change markers at the sides of the roads in a lot of places, and we can use the the road markings as well. As well. To, for the for the actual operatives to keep their station, we call that uh, holding their station uh, from where the IPB actually is. There's also specification for a minimum curb weight of 1.5 uh, tons for those vehicles. Other introduction and other introductions included uh, distance to the bottom of the sign. Now they, that was always there for level three roads, but for level one roads, it's 100 millimeters to the bottom of the sign, the diamond, or the bottom of the supplementary plate. Level two roads, that's 300 millimetres, to the bottom of the diamond only. The supplementary fit can be below that. And as you can see here, uh, we've also rationalised for ease of comprehension from the operator's perspective that all visibilities are now consistent. There used to be different visibilities for stop and go, for, for traffic signals. Um, they are now all consistent and all the same. Logos, as they always were, weren't there, but they also we have uh, specification for variable message signs. One of the big ones there is that there should only be two frames displayed because, again, so what does the road user, what can the road user comprehend in the approach to these? Those two frames, and those are the, the, the visibility requirements for those and the, the sizes for those. In terms of the sign dimensions, as I talked about earlier, we have these 450 signs uh, in the lower category roads because they're specifically designed that they pre present lower risk to the road user and the environments on which they're going to be used, whereas when we get up into the higher risk areas, the sign size is increased from 600, and then when we get to the 100 kilometres an hour, 750s, and then up on the, high, the real high speed roads, the 1.2s. Um, in terms of road work speed limits, there's also now an introduction of the size of signs to be used um, with road work speed limits, and also how often they should be repeated through the roadworks site and the sizes of those repeater signs. So those are all now specified in Chapter 8 as well. When we get to um, the actual equipment itself, um, uh, there was always an anomaly there for quite a period of time in terms of the stop and go boards and that it said that you should be using a 750 and may use a 600. But anybody who's ever tried to use a stop and go board, if they were using a 750 board and it was anyway one day, I would see you in Scotland or someplace because you, I don't know where, when you would touch ground again. So most of the boards that were actually been in use was 450s. So now that is actually now um, provided for in Chapter 8. The preferred option is 450 with the brackets 600. Uh, and there's descriptions in the guidance document about what those what those decisions are. Vehicle actuator, just to understand that that dimension is actually to the bottom of that green part of that lake. There's, so there's minimum dimensions and maximum dimensions measured for that as well. But the other thing, a very important thing, and Nathan will be going into more detail on this, is vehicle actuations of tra temporary traffic signals. Now, this has really been driven at this stage because, again, using the risk-based approach, when we're dealing with narrow roads in particular, um, a lot of times we can't get the 1.2 sideways safety zone. And then people are using countdown timers or ordinary traffic signals. And traffic on approach to those signals, let's call a spade a spade, uh, green means go, red means stop, and amber means go faster. Okay? And actually red means the next five cars, if you really float, you can get past. All right? So that's the road user behavior. Whereas... <clears throat> With vehicle actuate, so you, so in other words, you have speed going past your traffic, going past your work site. You, you, not only have you the speed that was originally there, you've probably exacerbated the problem for certain conditions uh, for traffic past your, your work site. And it's not really uh, suitable for you to say, oh, well, I can't get 1.2. What are you going to do? Bad road. Whereas with vehicle actuation, with their, vehicle actuation works because it always stops the traffic. It stops the traffic and then it allows it to proceed to the road. There's other things in terms of benefits, in terms of making sure that traffic isn't waiting there unnecessarily, which means that over time you'll build up this trust and people hopefully will obey the lights much better. But, uh, but, but for now, from a safety perspective, what it's doing is replicating stop and go without having to expose two stop and go board operators out there. And it's providing a safe system of work for your traffic, they only going into that. Now there are locations where that wouldn't be suitable. But certainly on the regional and the national network, uh, you really, we should be using 
vehicle actuated lights in the caveat that I talked about earlier. Uh, there's maximum traffic volume, 65 vehicles per lane prescribed in most situations, and that includes, for example, hard shoulder works on the motorway network. So we, we have two lanes on the motorway network. Uh, there is a maximum traffic volume um, for those. And uh, again, the, uh, a lot of debate about this and the research put in, and it really only affects operations when operations should be affected. So the numbers are run through different models using different traffic figures that we have across the network. Uh, the traffic volume tables are in there, as I talked about. Uh, they are obviously much more important now than what they ever were. So there's uh, Stephen in particular will be talking about those. And then we have the level three tapers. Uh, so we have the standard taper. In the old chapter, it, effectively, you're combining these tapers, particularly on level three roads. But what we have now is so a distinction between what would be a dual carriageway, i.e. you are legally entitled to drive on the hard shoulder, provided it is safe to do so. And that's denoted by this dashed yellow line, two on, two off. That taper length could be about 90 meters in length, depending on the width of the hard shoulder. Um, whereas now we have these um, the block cones on the hard shoulder. Now you probably see a lot of these actually in use currently with the breakdown vehicles used a lot of times. But what this is doing is you're not legally obliged or allowed to be driving on that hard shoulder in the first place. So these block lines. Now, the purpose of why, why are we doing this, the purpose of this is it's, it's about a third of the amount of equipment that's going into that taper, and that means a third of the time that the operative is exposed to risk. It's all about managing the risk. What is the benefit that you're getting versus what is the risk that you're exposing somebody to do to get that benefit? So this gets you the same benefit in a third of the time, which is why that uh, is now the – that is the, the, the um, taper that's to be used on motorway network. We get to this, Pascal called it the Christmas tree, with the Christmas tree taper, or the 180 taper. <clears throat> so the, the advantage of this is that if part of that taper is wiped out, that we still have a line of cones. Now, these tapers are getting wiped out. That's why this is a real issue. Uh, we still have a line of cones uh, that's indicating to the road user approaching that that the lane is actually closed. The other advantage of this is there's 40% less equipment in this than what would be a standard 240 meter taper. Okay, these cones are spaced at three meters apart on the taper, well, in 1.5s. Uh, most people are actually, I think, doing that anyway. We would say, but but now it's you're you're now legally covered. Uh, so you're so there's about 40 percent less equipment here. And again, this is a this is a high exposure. You're in a live lane here. Obviously, we have an IPV when we'll be installing that, but we're reducing the time the time of exposure to that risk by about 40 percent by using that new taper. So that's the the um, that's the taper of choice, and that's just a 3D image of what it looks like on the ground. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what's at the back of chapter eight, um, chapter eight again is a ministerial direction. The the text in it, it's it's legal text. It's 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 legally driven. It's saying what shall, what what must, in the in defining tables. But at the back of chapter eight, there are appendices which are attached, which give more graphical. Uh, uh, interpretations of the separate sections that are talked about. So in other words, if you're reading part of chapter 8 and you're wondering, well, what are they talking about central coning or what are they talking about longitudinal safety zone? These uh, graphics, for example, if you're reading the section on traffic signals, you refer to that graphic and that will explain in graphical format uh, what that particular part of chapter is describing. Now, the, the guidance documents aren't limited in that fashion and that they can have the graphics right up where they're actually talking about it and they can uh, break up those graphics into different sections, but for, uh, chapter eight being a legal text, uh, these are put in as appendices at the back, and that's just so that it's that that, you, that the reader can understand the specific things that cha that the that part of chapter eight is talking about. So that's for example the different layouts for level one roads, and then uh, well actually I should just go back there one. Um, you will see that the only time uh, we talk about multi lanes or duals, the only time that we use the wickets in uh, level one roads is when we're uh, up at the dual carriage, not even multi-lane, at the dual carriage section, but Aidan will be talking about that section, and that's what that graphic is talking about in chapter eight. So we're going to level two. Again, it's the same thing. There's just layouts to indicate, well, what's the different things? Now, these are obviously, they're not to scale. These graphics are not to scale. They're simply there to describe what that section of chapter eight is talking about. That's that's literally what they're there for, and that's just an example there of semi-static. Because and just to, I suppose to highlight that, obviously chapter eight is talking about semi-static and about the fact that works must be within two kilometres of that side. 
if this was an actual graphic, uh, uh, dimensioned graphic, we would have that two kilometer sign, but then every 500 meters we're repeating that set or that signage throughout the work. So it's just literally as an, an illustration to say, what, what are the aspects that that particular section of chapter is talking about? And there we have the same for um, level three roads. So in this instance here, we've got a hard shoulder closure. In this instance here, we're talking about a lane one closure on a two lane road, or a lane two closure on a two lane road. And in this instance here, a lane three closure on a three lane road. And there's just the graphics of where just literally after talking about the uh, lead in tapers. Um, in this instance here, it's going to be talking about what the transition length is because in the table, in level three tables, obviously there's a definition of, of uh, transition length, which is indicating what that transition length is. But it's also indicating to you that you can use the 180 or the Christmas tree taper on the entry taper, the lead-in taper, but also you use that on the facing wall. So you don't use it on the back wall, you use it on the facing wall. So it's indicating to you how you, you piece together the different, ver the different pieces of the table that's, that's outlined in chapter eight. And likewise here, it's indicating to us that we can use the hard shoulder taper um, for a three lane road when we're doing a lane one closure on a three lane road. So all these are quite well described in the graphics, but certainly a lot, if, I, if you're using any of these, you certainly will be going on to what Ian's going to be talking about next, his document, uh, the design guidance document. It also outlines the, the, uh, the signs for the trailer. So you can see here that previously this trailer would have been different, this trailer board would have been different to the other two trailer boards, but now they're all the same. Obviously the supplementary plate changes at the bottom. All these things are free and available at www.trafficsigns.ie. So you can download the three documents at www.trafficsigns.ie. And in that, you will also find in there the working drawings, which actually they give you the dimensions and the sizes of the decals, the real estate that they take up for each drawing that's actually listed in Chapter 8. And there's a link on that web page for the working drawings. So you can, you can see very clearly what the specification for the, for example, if it's RA2 fluorescent orange or RA2 standard orange um, and, and included in that would also be the supplementary plates and particularly the X heights for the supplementary plates used for the different sizes of, sizes of a sign. So where there's, let's say, more text, what X heights you should be using for the size of sign that you're actually going to be mounting that supplementary plate on. So and uh, to, to kind of cap, to outline and finishing up what sections are included in Chapter 8, and Aidan and, and Stephen will be going into this in much more detail. It does prescribe standards for junctions and layouts and how they should be signed for multi-lane streets. Multi-lane streets are streets that, for example, a one-way street on a town that have two lanes going in one direction will be described as a multi-lane street. A street with a bus lane in it with a, with a lane coming the opposite direction, or even just a bus lane on it, is a multi-lane street. All these the streets are multi-lane streets. So these are defined now in Chapter 8. Uh, Urban Jules has talked about climbing and overtaking lanes, the requirements for climbing and overtaking lanes, and, the, and how to control the hazards and risks associated with those. Um, and Level 3 roads, new things that have been now introduced that were not there before, is hard shoulder closures, merges and diverges, uh, run, hard shoulder running, which is going to become much more common as the network evolves, uh, the narrow lane systems, which again is going to become much more common for, uh, for road operations on level three roads, and then finally, a section on type two and type three dual carriages. So that's what the web page looks like. As I say, you get it on trafficscience.e. It's very clean looking, uh, and the working drawings, as I said to you, that's the link there for the working drawings, and you can get the new documents by clicking one of these links up here. So it's very straightforward and easy to use. Okay, so we, we might get going again. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, so we're we're running a small bit behind time, so we'll uh, we'll just try and myself and Stephen will try and try and get us back on track if if at all possible. So uh, my name's Aidan Cray. I'm a senior executive engineer with Cork County Council um, and part of the temporary traffic management project team for the last uh, two and a half three years and uh, primarily responsible just for the, the, the TTM design guidance document. So just quickly, the objectives of the document are effectively just to facilitate safe planning and design of TTM and to provide a consistent approach to all stakeholders when it comes to TTM design. 
It's also to provide uniform guidance in how you actually use roadwork signage uh, to ensure we have uh, uniformity across the network. Uh, and finally, it's to provide guidance suitable for incorporation into a roadwork safety management system uh, in, the in accordance with uh, health and safety legislation, so the, the Act and the uh, construction regs. I suppose the last one is, is, is important there, and uh, you'll see in the document, uh, Section 0 0.3 has a significant amount of information in relation to health and safety. Uh, there was some in the old guidance document as well, but this has been v made very much specific um, to uh, traffic management. So Charlie's already alluded to this, the, the, um, effectively the document replaces guidance for the control and management of traffic at roadworks or as, as a lot of people would have known at the Ashburn document um, from 2010. So that will be deemed to be withdrawn now at, at, the end of the, um, at the end of the transition period and the new t design guidance document I suppose is, is in place from today. Uh, it's important to note that the new design, design guidance document covers all road levels and all road types. So it has design guidance for everything from an urban street up to a, a high-speed uh, motorway. It's structured in, in four parts. Part zero is all the common parts, so the introduction, the competencies of the duty holders, uh, the legal background from a road's <laughs> perspective, the health and safety section I've mentioned. It goes through a step-by-step -step process in how you design temporary traffic management gives you all your design parameters, all the tables from uh, from chapter eight. It looks at the traffic control methods because they're common to, to, to the level one and two roads. So your stop and go and um, give and take, etc. It looks at junctions, roundabouts, um, and, and a few other items there. It also looks at actually importantly what's in the temporary traffic management plan and we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, part one just looks at urban guidance. So um, as Charlie said, primarily looking at vulnerable road users. Uh, part two, uh, guidance for rural single carriageways and part three guidance for uh, the high speed network. So again, if you're on the high speed network, you're really only looking at part zero and part three of the document. If you're Dublin City Council, you're probably looking at part zero and part one of the document. Uh, a lot of the other authorities may be looking at, at, uh, at multiple parts. So the first thing to, in, in uh, part zero is it actually defines the roles and responsibilities of the, of the actors uh, in terms of temporary traffic management. And since we're looking at the design guidance document, I'll just show the uh, those for the designer. So it's broken down into two parts. It's broken down into what's the competence for the designer and what's the roles and responsibilities. The top part, competence, Charlie will be talking a lot in detail about that just on our, on our training presentation at the end. But effectively, it's training, experience, and knowledge. And the important part of this this is the guidance given in the document as to how you should assess somebody's competent. It is up to the employer, though, to say who is competent. So the, the employer can use this to say, is this guy competent or not? But we, we can't tell you who is competent. That's up to the employer. And just from a design point of view, I suppose, the key one here is experience. Obviously, it has to be appropriate to the scale of the works and the hazards present. So the experience needed for somebody, um, they may have done a design training course, but the experience needed for somebody to design uh, a simple stop and go on a rural road versus the experience needed for somebody to design works on an interchange on the M50 are obviously significantly different. So it is up to the employer then to decide what experiences have this person has and how competent are they to do the, to do the job. Uh, on the bottom, just the roles and responsibilities, that just sets out, if, I suppose, from a legal point of view, uh, especially under the construction regs, what your roles and responsibilities as a designer are. So effectively, you have to identify hazards, apply the principles of prevention, take account of existing um, health and safety plans, prepare your drawings, your temporary traffic management, um, and also to cooperate with designers, the PSDP and PSCS. Just in relation to designer, it's, it's important to point out that a TTM designer is a designer under, under the construction regs and has the responsibilities of a designer, and they are coordinated by the PSDP. They may not be employed by the PSDP, they may come along at a much later stage in the process, but they are a designer and, and they have to be seen as such. So in part zero, we've, Charlie's talked a lot about risk management uh, in terms of the road levels, and effectively that's what we we look at in terms of designing traffic management, it's in accordance with risk. It's not a one size uh, fits all scenario. So to look at it from a point of view of risk, we've broken it down into two steps. One is you look at making the, 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 the a safe place and step two is a safe, a safe person. So a safe place is effectively the designer looking at eliminating, substituting, isolating, controlling the hazards on the site. So he's looking at, can the work be done a different way? Is there a less risky method? Okay, we have to do the job. It's traf I need traffic management, so I'm going to isolate and control the hazards using my traffic management. Step two is the safe person. 
well, you need to have management controls in place for the guys on the site. So they need to have method statements, risk assessments, training, instruction, supervision, etc. They need to have uh, PPE. And finally, there should be an attitude uh, of um, and the culture of, of keeping health and safety number one when it comes to temporary traffic management. And, and in relation to that, we're kind of talking about ensuring that there's training and there's actually enforcement that you're auditing and inspecting what you're doing on a regular basis. We define what TTM risk assessments, the levels of risk and what the um, associated levels of control should be. So if you're in a low risk environment, and Stephen will give examples of this, well, standard basic controls are sufficient uh, the designer, for the designer to use. A medium risk environment, you may, may require some additional controls. Still possible to use a standard operating procedure that an organization might have, but there may be some additional controls required on the site. And uh, generally for, for that, you're still in type B works um, for those. The high risk is where we're talking about type A, more complex works where there's high risks involved and that's where you need site specific risk assessments by the designer who has visited the site, looked at it, specified the risks, specified control measures for those risks and also considered if, if the risks are such that it, it constitutes a particular risk um, under the construction regs. <laughs> In terms of documentation, uh, there's a lot of information now in there on, in, in what type of documentation you should have to manage uh, traffic management. The first one, I suppose, is for companies who are basically involved in traffic management, you'll have a safety statement. Do you have a declaration in relation to traffic management in that safety statement? Do you actually mention traffic management in, in your safety statement? Obviously, you should. Uh, the use of standard operating procedures and where they should and shouldn't be used, is, is uh, there's guidance given on that. And again, as I said a moment ago, they're suitable for low to medium risk um, TTM activities in general. They must have a clear scope. And if you're using a standard plan, um, we used to use the word generic plan. We don't use generic plan, a standard plan. If that's being used, it has to be assessed as appropriate to both the task and the location. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. And just a final one there for um, in terms of on larger contracts where you have say long-term works with a PSDP at design stage and PSCS and contractor coming on at a later stage, we have allowed for what's called a preliminary temporary traffic management plan at uh, a preliminary health and safety plan stage. And effectively all that is, it just means the PSDP isn't responsible for producing the final traffic management plan with drawings and layouts and all that on it. He's just going to be responsible for saying, right, these are the parameters that will have to be used at, at a later stage when the detailed plan is designed. So this is the road level whether, for example, stop and go will be allowed, whether how many lanes need to be left open, whether a road closure will be allowed, that kind of thing can be specified at, um, at preliminary stage. The plan is developed then later uh, at, at PSCS stage. So we talk a lot about a temporary traffic management plan. Uh, so in the document, we've actually defined what we mean by a temporary traffic management plan. And, and the key thing is what it's not. It's not a layout drawing. So a temporary traffic management plan is not a drawing with signs on a road. A temporary traffic management plan is an actual job information pack that tells you where that drawing came from, how it, how it was designed, uh, even in some cases who designed it, uh, how it's to be put out on the road and how it's to be removed from the road. So effectively, it's, it's a job information pack. That's what a temporary traffic management plan is. And the contents of that plan will be entirely reliant on what type of works you're doing. So what's the scale of works you're doing? If you're doing type A works, a kind of a complex job, as I said, that's where we're talking about having a site-specific, the DRA here means design risk assessment. So a designer is going to do a site-specific risk assessment for the TTM. He's going to have specific design information, a location map, the TTM plan is going to be on a site layout drawing or in a survey drawing or an OS tile. There could quite likely be a layout specific method statement by the designer. For example, if there's multiple phases describing how you move between each phase. So there's a lot of information going to be in that commensurate to the to scale of works. Whereas if we're looking at type B works, so kind of routine maintenance operations, well then there's no requirement to have that scale of work uh, or that scale of, of plan. What you're looking at is if you have a standard operating procedure, you're using that. Your design information can be recorded just on a, on a one-page sheet which, which assesses the, the suitability of your standard operating procedure. You could be using a standard plan and your method statement could be part of your standard operating procedure so it's not being written specifically for that site. And just to show you what we mean by what is say, a type B works pack for a typical maintenance job, um, 
if we're doing work, say, stop and go on a rural road, uh, this is your standard operating procedure. This is taken directly from the uh, operations document, so it's a sample of a standard operating procedure. It has a drawing here of the um, of the, the setup that's required for stop and go on a, on, a, on a level two road. It has some guidance at the top as to how you use it. It has parameters over here, and importantly over here is the installation and removal methodology. So that's what makes it an operating procedure as opposed to just a drawing. It's telling you how, telling the operator how to install and how to remove it. With that, you need to make sure that that's assessed, that it's actually appropriate, because it's a standard plan. It's not saying this is on road, whatever, R315 or whatever. You need to, you need to make it specific to the site. So we've put in this form, there's variants that people can come up with themselves, but this is the form that we've put in that basically says, right, I'm going to look at the site, uh, I'm going to assess the visibility in the top half there, I'm going to look at the visibility, the speed, what type of road it is, and then I'm going to look at the works, so I'm going to say how long are they going to take, what's the unobstructed road width, and if all the stuff in these two boxes here complies with what's on this drawing, I'm good to go, I select my traffic management and I, um, I select what signs I'm using. So it's it's a site-specific assessment that's making the standard plan specific to the task and to the site. And just finally, you need a risk assessment as always. So I just I just put in the the sample one there from the from the um, SSWP for working on roads. So moving on, we have also looked at uh, audits and inspections. Uh, if you're involved in temporary traffic management, I suppose the question is: Are you inspecting your own traffic management? Are you auditing systems uh, that you're using for traffic management? And we've defined what we mean by inspections and audits. So an inspection is basically a site-level examination of the standard of temporary traffic management. Is it fit for purpose and in accordance with the TTMP and installed correctly? So you're kind of looking at the nuts and bolts of uh, where are the signs, are the right signs used, are there the right spacing, is the right safety zone in place, etc. When we talk about audits, we're talking about a higher level analysis of the standard of TTM in place and the systems in place within the organization to manage them. So what we're saying there is you might still look at a site as part of an audit, but you'll follow up on the on the paper trail, basically. So you will look, at a typical example, if, you, if someone's using stop and go on a site, everything might be working absolutely perfectly. An inspection, you look at it, everything is grand. And an, as, as an audit, you'd say, right, well, under the Road Traffic Act, you're supposed to have notified the guards. Have you notified the guards? Have you a system in place for managing uh, notifications? <coughs> A guy could be using standard plan on site, everything on site is working perfectly. It's part of an audit, what you're going to say is, okay, is there an organizational policy that manages the use of those standard plans? Like where's the, I suppose, the policies and procedures to back up you actually using standard plans? So that's effectively what, what we've looked at. We've given two forms at the back in the appendices. Um, these are just the front page of the forms, they're a bit longer than that. Uh, uh, an inspection form and an audit form. Again, inspection just goes line by line down through everything that could possibly be on a site. Uh, if it's green, everything's good. If it's amber, there's something slightly wrong, but it's it's uh, it's a minor non-conformance. If it's red, major non-conformance. There's an immediate risk uh, to the health of the or the safety of the road workers or the road users, and something has to be has to be done. Similarly for audits, the same scenario. Uh, it's just graded between um, between green and red. So just a couple of things in the in part zero, we look at design elements, tapers, and all that. So I'll just focus on one or two that have changed, or where there's new guidance. The first one is on VMSs. Um, Charlie already mentioned it. There's guidance on message content. Um, the message content being two, maximum two frames, but also the frames should be the warn and for and inform. So you warn, inform, direct, and end on a, on a roadwork site. On a VMS, you're not going to be able to put all that information in. So what you need to concentrate on is warning and informing the road user. Positioning and protection are dealt with just in terms of graphics. Uh, I suppose for for the level three users here, generally there's there's slightly different um, slightly different guidance there in relation to it's they're generally always put behind a safety barrier. This is say a typical national primary road. The 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 first option is always put it behind a safety barrier if there is one. Uh, the second option, uh, if you have no safety barrier, it can be put on the verge, but you should close off the hard shoulder with a, a block line of cones in advance. The third option, if you have to put it on a hard shoulder, which it may have to, you close off the hard shoulder with two block lines of cones. And the final option, if it's, there's no hard shoulder and it's just in the grass verge, you should still put a line of cones outside it just for visibility at night uh, or when the, um, if the VMS is turned off at night. There's detailed guidance on barriers, uh, including how you select between vehicle barriers and, and uh, Tempe vehicle restraint systems. 
just the drawing here uh, that's in just I suppose to give us some idea of what type of guidance is in there on the right hand side we have uh, a temporary vehicle restraint system on a, on a motorway and so just the key things that we've put in there for example there's a 30 meter lead in of cones before the leading edge of the barrier um, for protection uh, and in the 3D graphic there that's just an example of just showing um, where a barrier is in place that there's always a setback the, the thin purple line on the outside which is 400 mils at 80 kilometers an hour and 600 mils uh, at, uh, at greater. And also, if that um, barrier is acting as uh, impact protection, it has to have a clear, um, the, the clear area behind it uh, highlighted in yellow there where, where no activity can take place. In terms of traffic control methods, the drawings are standardized across all the documents. So the same format you'll see across all the documents. Typical example of um, traffic lights here. If by the way, if it's a green, if it's a green verge, you're on a rural road. If it's a grey verge, you're on a um, you're on a, an urban road. Uh, I suppose we haven't changed things significantly about stop and go or the way they operate or or um, any of the traffic counts or anything. But it, there are a couple of things which Charlie alluded to earlier on. Vehicle actuated traffic lights. It's now specified they should be used on national and regional routes. Again, we're not talking about urban areas because that that can present problems with the vehicle actuation. But on national and regional routes, you should be using vehicle actuated lights for two reasons. The first one Charlie has covered in terms of making sure that all vehicles stop and they're not running red lights and running uh, amber lights. Uh, the other reason is it actually improves traffic flow. When you get up to higher traffic volumes, it operates like stop and go. So it takes account of the traffic flow coming in both directions. In relation to just a convoy there, we have guidance. It does, it's, Convoy operates the same as it always did, but now effectively what we're saying is if you get to a situation where you're running convoy at greater than 900 vehicles per hour, you should be using three convoy vehicles, not two. It's not to do with safety, it's to do with traffic flow because as a designer we have a, a responsibility to ensure that we don't interfere with traffic flow too much. When you get up to the higher traffic counts, uh, three convoy vehicles will actually provide a much quicker traffic flow through the site. There's guidance on junctions, uh, and this is really just based around when you're designing at junctions, it depends on where the works are in proximity to the junction, and the key issue that you need to have is visibility. And by visibility, we mean have you got the required visibility, say, on a side road to the stop-go man or to the signs. Um, design approach speed can be reduced on the junction side of the works. So I just I put up a drawing here. What we mean by this, if these two roads are 80k an hour roads meeting, it is reasonable to assume that anybody turning off this road and turning down the side road can't be traveling at 80 kilometers an hour the minute they turn off. So you can reduce just for this section here your visibility requirements to those of a 50 kilometer an hour road. And as I said, the key issue as to when you need to put signs on the main road and when you need to uh, or when you can take them off is have you got visibility to your signs and to your stop go guy here? And at 50k an hour, you need 50 meters visibility to a stop go guy. So if you've got 50 meters from this junction to the stop go guy, there's no need to put stop go guys out on the other legs. But you don't have the correct visibility to the two signs, the roadworks ahead and flagman. So you just need to provide them on the other side of the junction. That's it's simple as that. And in a situation then just where you end up having less than the required visibility to the stop go operator here. He is then in danger if you just leave him there. You need to provide three-way stop and go. So there's there's guidance on that, primarily for for rural roads um, th throughout part zero. Moving on to part one and looking at urban TTM, uh, there's guidance on TTM design and urban areas because it's it's different, obviously, from rural areas. The risks are different, and we specify what those risks are. The risks are specifically vulnerable road users, uh, restricted geometry, so the proximi proximity to junctions, entrances, etc. The presence of heavy vehicles and heavy traffic, uh, vehicle and vulnerable road user maneuvers. So here what we're talking about is the presence of parking bays, um, pedestrian crossings. We look at access to premises and making and sure you provide correct width through your temporary traffic management for access to premises. And we look at the interaction with public transport. So what happens if you're dealing with buses, taxi ranks, etc. Following on from that, we look in more detail then at vulnerable road users, multi-lane streets, urban dual carriageways and urban semi-static. Uh, for vulnerable road users, I'll, I'll quickly go through this because there's a lot of information on the slide, but there's a new temporary pedestrian crossing sign, WK82, and where that's to be used is if you're putting out a place, a formal, if you're putting in place, sorry, a formal pedestrian crossing in your traffic management, it's also used then if you want to warn a driver that somebody's crossing at a, at a, a location that they mightn't expect. Um, the pedestrian uh, cross left and cross right, 
effectively they're used where the footway is closed and pedestrians should cross to the left or right but also now we've allowed them to be used if you have to divert pedestrians on a path that they wouldn't be expecting so you might be diverting them on a complex route through the site you can use those signs we specify five general control methods for pedestrians so accommodate on the existing footway or desire line so you cut you 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 tailor your traffic management to where the pedestrian actually wants to go you provide a temporary footway you can provide a temporary crossing you could divert to the other footway or you can provide a pedestrian controller and again it's up to the temporary traffic management designer depending on the risk on the particular site to select which one of these he's he's going to use if he decides to provide a, a, a temporary footway on the road this is the, the sample drawing for how you do that just the important two points about it being the longitudinal safety zone and the lateral safety zone are provided outside of the walkway so you give the same protection to the pedestrian as you would have been given to the road worker <coughs> equally in terms of use of the new sign just an example if we close a crossing here and we want to move it down this side road well then we need to warn the uh, motorist that the, that the crossing is now in a different place so we just provide this temporary pedestrian crossing sign and just we provide the pedestrian arrow signs to direct the pedestrian to the new location we spent a lot of time looking at cyclists guidance uh, including looking at places like Denmark and other places for, for guidance and what to do with uh, cyclists at roadworks so there's a couple of key things there um, the cyclist present sign we've defined in particular in urban areas where you should use that so one area where should you should use it is if you're proposing to narrow the lanes to less than 3.3 meters uh, on a particular road and there's cyclists present then you need to warn the cyclists and the motorists so you put up the sign if so long as the works is greater than 50 meters in length it, if it's a very short site they can weave in and out it, it doesn't make any difference but we also have specified you need to use that sign where you're closing a mandatory cycle lane so if there's a non carriageway or an off carriageway mandatory cycle lane and you're closing it and putting cyclists out onto the running lane it's fine to do that you can risk assess doing it but you need to warn the motorists that it's happening by by using that sign the cyclists keep left keep right sign for where you're diverting cyclists on a different path to motorists and just finally there is uh, guidance on when you should and shouldn't use the uh, the cycle lane end sign or the the combined uh, pedestrian cycle system so i'll show you that on a on a layout now in a moment the controls for cyclists you can share the running lane with vehicular traffic you can provide a dedicated cycle track you can provide, put them into a bus lane you can provide dedicated cycle track on the carriageway um, or you could provide a pedestrian combined pedestrian cycle track if you ha if you had the wits. On this site, just to show you, if you were closing a mandatory cycle lane, so this this is a mandatory cycle lane. It's got a solid white line, so vehicles can't cross that white line. If you want to close that, well, you're going to be putting a cyclist out into a running lane where a vehicle wouldn't be expecting it. You provide this sign to warn the motorist that there's no cyclist present on the carriageway. You also provide the cycle lane end sign because you're legally closing a, a cycle lane. And just on the bottom there, in terms of lane widths, that's a significant change from the existing uh, lane width guidance that you should avoid. If you're running a shuttle traffic uh, where the cyclist is sharing the lane with the with the motorist, you must avoid using 3.5 to 4 meters uh, of a lane width. At less than 3.5, the cyclist is going to be okay because the vehicle has to follow him. At greater than 4, there's likely to be space. But between 3.5 and 4, that's the space that a HGV or a bus may look to overtake a cyclist but doesn't have the safe space to do it so you must avoid that lane that that lane width multi-lane streets just to the, the quick thing on this is just to make sure that people know the correct signs uh, we specified that it wasn't always clear under the old chapter 8 if you're on a multi-lane street and you're closing a lane you use a, a, a road narrow sign you do not use a lane closed sign this is how it's used we have two lanes going that way, we have one lane coming back this way, we're closing the one lane, so effectively we would say road narrows and we provide them on both sides if possible on the multi-lane side and just on one side on the, on the single lane side. But we don't use a, uh, a lane wicket on, on those roads because you may give the impression to the, um, to the guy on the multi-lane side that there's nothing coming towards him on the other side. Uh, urban dual carriageways is where you use your um, your lane wicket signs and just an example of one of the drawings from an urban dual carriageway where we're closing two lanes as Charlie said earlier on bus lanes are traffic lanes so they're always treated the same you don't treat them any differently from a normal traffic lane um, in this case we recommend you use a transition length if you can in an urban area if the site is too small the designer can risk assess leaving out that transition length it's, it's not an issue and just someone had been speaking about earlier on urban semi-static operations 
we've given guidance and traffic counts. I suppose this is specifically, by the way, in, in connection with talking to uh, some people in Dublin City Council, for how you do, we call it a semi-static operation, but it's basically your gully cleaning moving moving slowly along a road, and it's effectively dealt with with traffic counts of visibility, the same as rural roads, but there's just specific tables depending on whether you're on a single carriageway or multi-lane street. If you're on an urban dual carriageway, just to give an example, we don't call them mobile lane closures because you, you won't have trailer boards, they're static signs, and just what we're saying is, well, you provide your man at works two kilometers ahead, your mobile road works subplate with which lane is closed, and you just repeat that sign every 500 meters in an urban area. Um, they should be dealt with by designers, unless you have kind of a standard operation procedure done by a designer. There's traffic counts um, and visibility requirements, uh, depending on um, what speed you're at as well, and just the visibility to IPVs um, where they're being used in the in the uh, on the an urban dual carriageway. On rural roads, they're the sections that are in the rural document. So I'll just go straight to minor roads. Um, the relaxations for minor roads in terms of diversions and surface dressing done as an SSO are still there. Uh, we've given more specific guidance now, though, on where you want to design to the operating speed of a, of a minor road. So you see the text there. Effectively, the text there says that um, TTM design is always designed to the, to the regulatory speed limit, but in some circumstances, it can be considered that the approach speed is significantly different to the posted limit you can design to the approach speed. So just two examples of rural roads. They're both 80 kilometers an hour. They're both defined as minor roads because they have less than 1,000 vehicles ADT and less than 5.5 meters wide. But obviously, on the top uh, road, it would be entirely reasonable to design that to 60 kilometers an hour rather than 80 because there's nobody driving at 80 kilometers an hour. Maybe in the midst of, a, of the West Cork Rally or something, they might be doing it, but not on a, on a normal basis. On, on the road in the bottom, it's about five meters wide. There's a reasonable chance somebody's traveling at 80 kilometers an hour, so it wouldn't be appropriate um, to say, I'll, I'll design that to 60. And again, we just say, don't reduce it below 60. You just, 60 is the, is the limit. <coughs> again, on rural roads, a very important thing that, that crops up is a lack of uh, space to have a lateral safety zone. Uh, so we have given, I suppose, a risk assess process. If you want to reduce the lateral safety zone, you can do it, but you have to go through a set of steps that means you've assessed every other way of doing the job and the only way of doing the job is to reduce the lateral safety zone. So effectively, just very quickly, the steps are, the first one is have you used the minimum lane width? You know, have you actually designed it to the minimum lane width in the first place? If you have, have you reassessed the works and seen if you can actually do it a different way? If you can't, then can you widen the road? In some cases on rural roads, you'd be able to like strengthen the hard shoulder or something if you're going to be there for a long time and, and give yourself a bit of extra space. Obviously, on our, our bridge here in the background, that's that's not going to be possible. Have you looked at using convoy working or marshalling? Uh, most most of the time, convoy working will be suitable, but sometimes it won't. Uh, in the case of the bridge here, there's about six, 800 meters of windy, twisty, single carriageway with nowhere to turn um, on both sides of that bridge. So convoy working won't really work because you don't have um, you don't have visibility on it, but you also don't have room to turn convoy vehicles. So if you couldn't use convoy work, then you assess, should I actually close this road and divert traffic? And again, on long-term works, that may be suitable, but if you have a barrier repair here for four or five hours on that bridge, the next best diversion on that road, because the national road, would be about a 30-kilometer um, detour with multitudes of signs and VMS signs warning people and sending them across very, like multi multitudes of junctions. It would take a couple of days to set out the traffic management for the diversion alone. It's not reasonable to do it for four or five hours. So at that point, you say, right, I'm going to look at the risk of doing that is greater than actually reducing the safety zone. So I'm going to reduce the lateral safety zone to half a meter. And just the very key point at the end is, if you do that, you have to control the speed. You can't just say I'm reducing the lateral safety zone. You need to get the speed through the works down to 60k. And Charlie has explained it earlier on, very good way of doing that, vehicle actuated lights, um, because it will stop every vehicle. And if you keep the site short, you keep it down to about 100 meters or something, nobody can speed through the site if everybody has been stopped um, at the start of the site. So moving on to semi-static operations. Uh, there's significant changes to the way semi-static operations are now done on rural roads. There's now traffic counts and visibility specified. It's broken down into two. In the first case is unobstructed road with greater than 2.5 meters. That simply means uh, somebody can actually drive past the works while it's going on. Um, if you want to use semi-static, there's a maximum, or sorry, if you want to use give and take in that scenario, there's a maximum ca traffic count of 20, and there's a visibility requirement of 215 meters. That's the full stopping site distance. 
if you haven't got those you have to use stop and go and again there's um there's requirements there for traffic counts uh simply what we're saying is that uh if it's not a straight road and you can't see sufficient distance past the works you need to use stop and go i suppose in, in simple terms that's that's just a, a, a layout where we are using uh, a flagman the no overtaking sign um on all rural roads now you use the no overtaking sign if somebody can overtake i don't we don't mean by that if there's a solid line or a broken line we mean if the road is physically wide enough there's a risk of somebody overtaking you use the no overtaking sign if the road is three meters wide and you're down a rural country road using an overtaking sign is completely pointless so you just you don't have to use it and just for the for the the opposite of that on a narrow road uh steven uh, uh we showed the picture earlier on with the jcb on the on the narrow road there's less than 2.5 meters so the works have to be moved off to actually allow somebody pass there's a different set of parameters in terms of the maximum vehicle count uh three minutes is 15. We look at visibility to the works vehicle, but the important one is the visibility to the operative. So the, if the operative is working on the ground, say filling potholes behind a truck, you have to have 90 meters visibility to them. And what that means is if there are bends on the road and they go around the bend, it's not okay to leave them there. What you need to do is provide either stop and go or block cones um, across the road. On a minor rural road, it's perfectly okay to put three cones across the road for the 10 minutes the guy's filling the pothole and come back and take them away afterwards. And I suppose that's just the, the the type of layout that's that's there for uh, for those minor roads. There's there was no guidance prior to this on what you did on overtaking lanes, so we've put in standard layouts for overtaking lanes. And the key principles being, if at all possible, you don't let two lanes to, uh, you don't allow um, double lane traffic to start. So you start your traffic management before you get to the, to the climbing lane. You cone off your hard shoulder. You cone off your central median to regulate traffic to bring it down slower you use road narrow signs you never use uh, a lane close sign on a on a um on an overtaking lane uh, and effectively that's the way you should do it in some cases there are climbing lanes that could be <laughs> 10 kilometers long if you were eight kilometers up that at your works it wouldn't be it wouldn't be reasonable to close the whole thing from the start so we have given an option of, of what you do in that instance as well so moving on to part three, high-speed jewels, uh, dual carriages and motorways. I suppose they're the topics that are covered in it. So everything from advanced warning signage to tapers to lane closures to merges, diverges, hard shoulder running, narrow lane systems, crossovers, contraflows, single bag operations, cyclists. Uh, I don't have a slide on it, but we have guidance on what to do when, when you start encountering cyclists coming through lane closures on dual carriageways. Obviously, they shouldn't be on a motorway. Um, they can be on a dual carriageway legally, so you may need to deal with them. So there's there's guidance there on how to do that, and there's there's guidance on mobile lane closures. Um, just some of the items that are in there that wouldn't have been in the previous uh, design guidance and wouldn't have been specified: cone placement and setback. So we specified that uh, this is what you should do in most cases on a longitudinal cone run: set the cone back 500 mil from the lane line so that it's not getting struck and there's less maintenance. But uh, if you're in a situation where you don't have space, particularly you could be working on a hard shoulder and, and getting the 500 setback could make you have to actually close lane one, well, it is appropriate for the designer to kind of risk assess it and say, look, I'm, I'm going to put the cone right up to the lane line. It can never be over the lane line or you're into narrow lane systems, but he can put it up to the lane line. Barrier setback is covered. I think I covered that earlier on, just the dimensions, uh, 400 and 600. <clears throat> Barrier setback is not optional under any circumstances. Barrier setback has to be provided from a, from a live lane. For the advanced warning signage, it's now mandatory to provide a setting out at Roadworks ahead sign when operatives are installing the advanced signage if they're going to be in the carriageway or if they're going to be crossing the carriageway installing those signs. So what we mean there is effectively if guys are installing these, uh, these signs, they eat, they're most likely in this case with a narrow central median. They're going to be there's going to be an IPV here protecting them, installing the median signs. If that's the case, you must provide this sign back 500 meters up the road just to warn the road user that there's actually somebody in a live lane ahead of them. Once they have the advanced warning signs installed, this can be turned off or the phases can be changed or whatever. But like it's to protect them basically just while they're installing the signs. And the preference, by the way, is to put it on a VMS with two frames. If not, a trailer board can be used if, if there's no suitable place for the VMS to go. So the lane taper, uh, the new lane taper, uh, Charlie has covered. It's 180 meters, uh, 36 meter increments. I suppose that's a kind of a clearer picture of what it looks like in reality. Uh, again, one cone, two cones, three, four, five. It just assists um, in 
making sure if a taper is struck, but also assist the operatives in putting it out because they line the taper up to the to the block lines. And just in terms of roadwork speed limits, we've now shown you where a roadwork speed limit sign should go in accordance with. It was actually specified in text, but we now showed it in drawings. So uh, the roadwork speed limit is not supposed to go way back up the road before the um, the roadworks ahead sign. The roadwork speed limit is actually supposed to come into place about 100 meters in advance of the taper. That's where the roadwork speed limit is supposed to come into place. Um, the the speed limit change ahead sign should go back here just after the um, the WK001 sign. So at about, in this case, these are a kilometer spacing, so it's about 800 meters back. So that's effectively where the roadwork speed limit should go. On the other end of that site, I haven't got the drawing, but the road the roadwork speed limit goes back up to the 120 only after the ro the um, roadworks end sign. It doesn't go before the roadworks end sign. It goes after the roadworks end sign. For lane closures, this is just the example of the drawing. The way the lane closure drawings are shown, um, Charlie highlighted this earlier on. For example, that's the new uh, 180 taper. Again, it's used on the on the facing wall as well. In this case, we have a motorway, so that's the use of the new uh, block lines of cones. Uh, it's, it's not drawn to scale, but that's the new use of the new block lines of cones. This, the new side access sign is shown here, and it may be difficult to see there on the screen, but we said now that you should, it's the common practice for most of the marks anyway, but you should use a, a green cone in addition to the other cones just at the site entrance to, um, to, to highlight it to the, to the guys using it. There is a difference now between type A and type B um, closures in many scenarios. This is type A works where you're closing lane 3 and lane 2 before a lane 1 and 2 closure. There is a transition length here, it's it's twice the length of the taper minimum. If you're doing type B ward works on that road, the designer can risk assess to say I'm going to use a direct uh, two lane because the, the exposure is less, you're there for less time and there's less traffic. <coughs> Similarly by the way, and, and Charlie had mentioned it, in relation to median signs, if you're doing a lane one closure on a three lane road, so you're just closing this this lane on a three lane road, for type B works, you are now allowed to omit the, the median signs subject to a risk assessment. Um, and as the likes of the M50 and stuff, that's that's effectively what they have to do anyway, because if you're doing type B works, you're 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 not gonna have the, the time and the and the danger of installing these signs, the risk is too high. For merges, the signs are now defined as to what you should use in a merge. So the first one is you must use a, a merge point sign for the motorist on the on the main line. So just to show that one goes in there for the motorist. You must use a merge to the to the right sign uh, for the people coming down the slip road. So that should just go in there. And finally, you also need to warn people on the slip road what lane is closed ahead. So that's just the lane closure. Um, similarly with diverges, just the one thing we want to highlight in diverges is we, we've given a dimension that that diverge opening should be, which is generally 140 to uh, 280 meters subject to design considerations. That's really just in relation to that's that's the specification for um, for, for road design as to what uh, what width it should be. <coughs> uh, direct, fine. direct lane one closures. There is now. Uh, a, a risk assessed process in there for if you want to do a direct lane one closure so we're not doing fast into slow we're directly closing lane one this is specifically for short duration works less than eight hours it has to have a site specific risk assessment by a designer so the designer has to visit the site and specify that this is okay to do um, in addition to that there's a, a, a number of additional control measures the first thing is you must use a taper on the shoulder so it's a constant taper the whole way from the start of the hard shoulder out uh, you must use sequential lamps on that taper. Uh, you have to increase the longitudinal safety zone by 120 meters, and you have to provide an IPV in there. And this is all to do at risk that the road user won't be expecting to encounter lane one to be closed. So what we're doing is we're throwing bells and whistles in terms of visibility, IPVs, sequential lights, warning the road user that there's something significantly different um, from what they'd normally have. So again, there's a there's a much lower traffic count from a normal static closure. It's uh, it's 40 per three minutes duration eight hours and uh, sequential lamps. Again, that was, uh, we, we did trials just to assess the, um, on, uh, sorry, the other one is there, you must provide a, an IPV or a VMS two kilometers in advance. That was, that was trialed on the, on the M9 just to see how it would operate. <coughs> the traffic count tables, Charlie has gone through them. Just the important thing to say is there's three traffic count tables. There's one for static operations. They're the traffic, they're the traffic counts for when guys are actually installing, um, installing the uh, the, the um, traffic management. 
There's traffic counts for direct lane ones. Again, they're reduced from what they would be for a normal static operation. And there's traffic counts for mobile lane closures. And obviously their traffic counts the whole way through the closure. So they're taken every 15 minutes through the, through the mobile lane closure. The important thing is each of those tables has almost a page of notes underneath it. So as a designer, if you're using them, you need to read and fully understand the notes to know what, what has been talked about in the traffic count table. Just finally, in the appendices, there's some useful forms to use if you're a designer. There's this form which kind of summarizes everything on the level one and two road. It shows you, say, your traffic control um, methods, what signs should be used. It also, on the back of it, uh, specifies, as what, specifies what sign you should use. Like, for example, type A works um, on, a, on a level two, one road. You're told you have to have four advanced signs. This just tells you what they are. One road works ahead, one overtaking, and two traffic management, which will be either two flagmen or two um, stop and go, depending on what you're doing. There's a, a new traffic management design risk assessment sheet. So if you're a designer, this sheet in the appendices basically gives you um, it's a, a, a template for doing a design risk assessment, a site-specific design risk assessment that has everything you need there from the road details, carriage details, road layout, and also guide, guides you on what hazards they are gets you to rate them as high, medium, and low, and then you decide what control measure um, you want to use. For high-speed networks, the traffic count sheets um, for uh, the various operations are actually in the back now of the design guidance document as well. And so really, that's, that's the, in, in conclusion, just to make sure that the document is to be used to maximize the safety of the workforce and the traveling public. That's the objective of a TTM designer. But it's also to make sure traffic uh, flows as freely as possible. Again, our vehicle actuation traffic lights are one example of that. Um, I suppose just we came across this picture at some stage uh, during the course of the project, which was, I suppose, the way we used to do traffic management for road lining. And they have a, a little red flag here. That's their traffic management. So hopefully with, with the guidance documents, we're, we're moving more towards a, a scenario where we're, we're using the likes of this uh, 3D image from the operations document to, to demonstrate what a, a proper TTM setup should be. So I'll hand over to Stephen, and uh, he'll go through the operations document. Um, thanks, Aidan. Um, my name is uh, Stephen Barry. I'm a senior engineer with Arup. I've been involved in, in the uh, TTM uh, <coughs> documentation suite since 2015, and been part of the um, project team since uh, 2017. I've been primarily um, <coughs> looking at the uh, operations guidance, so I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of the uh, of the document. <coughs> so, just looking at the uh, overview and the structure, this is the um, the fly sheet, as we call it, which is uh, I think Pascal and Charlie have uh, alluded to it already. This is at the start of uh, each of the three documents. So, where we have the chapter eight, um, the design guidance, and the uh, TTM operations guidance. So. Just looking and highlighting the chapter eight and the design guidance. So both of those documents uh, are basically what you actually do. So um, what, what Char Charlie and Aidan have, have gone through in, in some in some detail already. So that basically tells you uh, what you do in in, in graphical terms uh, using the uh, parameter tables, etc. So looking at the operations guidance, it, it's all about rather than not what what uh, you actually do. It's basically how you actually do it. So it's all about how. So it's basically you're, if you're basically out in sight, and, um, and and Pascal said it earlier as well. You have a TTM plan that you've been given by your supervisor, or possibly your your senior engineer, etc. And you're basically wondering how do I get all with this plan from sheet of paper out in sight? How do I get all this kit um, from from the truck out in sight and um, getting installed? Uh, how do I get it removed in a, in a safe manner? So the TTM operations guidance is basically go, goes through that uh, in some detail and gives, uh, gives guidance on it. Again, the, uh, like the design document, it's split into four parts. Um, part zero, um, giving introduction and background. Uh, part, part one for the level one roads. Part two for the uh, rural roads. And part three for the high speed network. So just looking at the uh, uh, part zero first really, and some of the uh, objectives. So again, it say concentrates on the both the road workers and the road users. So again, what we're looking at is providing a safe passage for the road users and also identifying and promoting um, safe methods for the road workers. Um, it also looks at looking at um, providing guidance on the planning implementation 
uh, maintenance modification and removal of TTM and looks at providing a consistent approach for all those involved in, 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 in TTM itself. <laughs> looking at the scope, so again, as I said, so we're looking at providing operational guidance for TTM uh, on all roads. The target audience for it is basically it's the TTUS, who's the temp temporary traffic operations supervisor, um, and, and it may also be used by uh, others involved in, in TTM operations. So the, the important thing regarding the TTUS is that it, it, it is the, the target audience. Um, <coughs> the, it's written, the document is written in simple language, um, and so far as possible. It also uses 3D graphics, 2D graphics, photographs, flowcharts. Um, <coughs> rather than you being text heavy, just because, because it, it, it's aimed at, at the isn't it the person at the guy, guy's open, open site, so <coughs> that's where it, it's aimed at. It may also be used by stakeholders to allow the development of their, their own SOPs, which are the standard operating procedures. Um, <coughs> part zero uh, covers some of the general principles. So these just here on the left, the, some briefly there, some of the setting out and placing TTM equipment, looks at items such as post installation review and also the TTM uh, operation methods. <coughs> Again, the, it, it goes into some detail on the principles which uses um, photographs where, where, where possible rather than kind of going into huge, huge depth of detail in, in, in text. So here we have, in an urban scenario, we have a, <coughs> our operative, basically where there is a footpath in place and um, is using the well, walking on the road, which is not what the uh, should should be done. Um, the document looks at the um, the and next and the, and the green tick. So it's basically we have the operative here on the right hand side, the green tick where using the footway where where that's in place. Down the bottom is another example where we have our operatives. Uh, they're unloading the TTM equipment from their TTM vehicle. So they're unloading from the live side. Um, so they're out, out in the light carriageway. That's um, not what's recommended. Here in the, the bottom right-hand corner, we have the TTM operatives, and they're unloading the TTM vehicle from the non-life side of the vehicle, which is what is recommended. So they're uh, standing on the um, footway in, in the safe way, which rather than being out in the light carriageway. <coughs> also looking at the general <coughs> principles, so be are open site, and you've been given the plan, and you think that there are some problems with it, and you're, you're scratching your head and wondering what, what you do. So the operation guidance goes through um, in some detail on what you actually do if you're in that scenario. So if you are in that scenario, you, you do not implement the TTM plan on site. You need to revert to your supervisor um, or possibly the TTM designer and inform them of uh, whatever your concerns are. And it's only at the point where your concerns have been resolved should you then implement the TTM layout out, out, out in site. Part here also looks at the uh, roles and responsibilities. I think earlier Aidan looked at the TTM designer, so here I'm going to be look at, looking at the TTUS and the operative as well. So the TTUS um, needs to have a three-day SLG. Um, if that TTUS is working on a level three road, they need to have an accredited TTM level three qualification. Um, some of the roles and responsibilities include the supervising the site, monitoring and ensuring TTM remains in place, and maintaining the site records. On the right hand side, we have the TTM operatives. Again, so if a TTOS is not on site, um, at, at least one operative must hold the one day health and safety roadworks card. Um, <clears throat> if they are working on the level three network, then they need to have an accredited TTM level three qualification. And just looking at underneath that, so some of the um, roles and responsibilities. So they would be installing, modifying, removing TTM. Um, but again, that would be under the supervision of the TTUS. Um, they, they can make minor alterations or amendments to the TTM. Like the examples would be if um, some cones fell, fell over, signage fell, fell over, then they would be able to um, re erect those signs or those, those cones, but they wouldn't be altering the TTM unless they're um, under the supervision of the TTOS. Moving on to part one, this is the um, urban and low-speed roads. So just looking at the scope, um, <coughs> so the, uh, Aidan has um, touched on it already. Um, the urbans, there's specific um, characteristics there regarding um, uh, urban, so items such as limited road width, 
you're looking at traffic signals, pedestrian crossings, junctions, um, parked cars, um, there's numerous uh, street furniture. So there's uh, items that, such as that. So the, basically it makes the decision making and the rationale pretty much unique in, in urban areas. So <clears throat> when we started on the part one uh, of the document, so it, there was significant interaction with the stakeholders. So Cork City and the Dublin City Council both came to us with issues. They said that they had um, <clears throat> issues with Chapter 8 that they couldn't meet. Um, so we, they, they came to us and they were part of the, um, <clears throat> the decision making on what, what the, some of the solutions were. So there was a significant interaction with, with both of those uh, local authorities. This is the uh, traffic management process. <clears throat> so the operations, the document for you know, the, all, all the three parts, and it starts off uh, with a, a flow chart on the, the process, um, gives a step by step guidance, then it looks into, goes into detail on each of those steps, and then gives applications afterwards. So here we have um, the traffic management process for the uh, <coughs> urban areas. So up here where we have on step one, where we have the operation procedure. So basically just asking the question, if there's <coughs> an SOP in place, and basically the guidance is, if there is an SOP in place, then you go and you, you use that, um, which is your, your green box here on the right hand side. If there isn't, then you go down through um, <coughs> the following steps. So step two being, um, lo looking at the traffic count and looking at a three minute count taken in the business direction. So <clears throat> again, if the traffic volume is, a, is above the count, then you need to go, the red box there indicates where you need to go and you consult your TTM des designer. Um, if it's not, then you're, going, you're looking at step three, you're assessing the time required. How long is the job going to take? Is it going to take uh, less than 50 minutes? Is it going to take greater than 15 minutes? Looking at the hazards. Um, so at step four, you're looking at your plan. Again, you're looking at the duration. Is it greater than 12 hours, less than 12 hours? And um, looking at speed, the road type, and then you're uh, using the TTM plan in accordance with the, with the tables. The next step here on the, on the right hand side, these are, I think Aidan had uh, these graphics up uh, previously. This is where you risk assess for the additional controls. So inside this box here, where we have the different items that, um, that Aidan spoke about, where we were basically looking at the vulnerable road users for your peds and cyclists. Looking at uh, restricted geometry, which in urban scenarios, we're dealing with legacy roads for, uh, in many cases, um, road user maneuvers such as um, car, parked cars and the cars maneuvering, heavy traffic, access to premises, maybe um, business businesses or um, <coughs> actual houses themselves. Um, public transport points, looking at um, taxi ranks and um, what you do with income for those and um, looking at the bus stops and um, also maybe in, in Dublin you're looking at um, the Lewis etc um, and what you do in those scenarios additional uh, considerations would be nighttime works or possibly unattended works so <clears throat> from that you're looking at uh, step the next step would be step six where you you're selecting your additional controls this is the um, risk control um, measures matrix so again we had a number of discussions with Dublin City and Cork City Council on, on this, and again, it's Pascal uh, and Charlie and Aidan have all, so it's all about risk. So this is our, our risk matrix. So on the bottom we have our likelihood. So basically, the likelihood is a <coughs> is a function of the, the works to be undertaken measured against the the, the site characteristics. Um, so that would be unlikely, likely, or very likely. Then on the left hand side we have our severity, which is basically if an accident were to occur, what would be the outcome, whether it's a major, serious, or minor. So from that you, you'll get your, um, whether it's a, a low, medium, or a high risk. So the, gu the guidance document goes through um, step by step and, um, guidance on that. This is a, a graphic that basically looks at the importance of speed regarding risk. So the one on the left hand side is basically what this um, looks at is if a, a pedestrian was to be hit at um, each of those different speeds, then what, what would be the outcome? So the one on the left hand side is if a pedestrian was to be hit at 30k, it's generally split in, in three, three, so it's, uh, whether it's minor, serious, or major. So but however, when you go from 30 over to 50, you can see there's a significant difference in 50k. Um, <coughs> the likelihood of it being uh, serious or major increases dramatically and when you move over to 60k basically it's nearly 100% being the 
uh, likelihood of it being a major injury. So that just shows the importance of moving on from 30 up to 50 slash 60 kilometers an hour. <coughs> so the, the matrix that we looked at a few slides ago, the guidance document looks at uh, more examples. There's just three here on this slide. So this slide on the <coughs> photograph on top, this is your lightly trafficked um, 30k housing estate. So again, the, the likelihood there would be unlikely. Um, <coughs> your severity would be serious. So that would give you here where we have our um, risk, overall risk would be low. The next example in the middle here, where we have a lightly trafficked um, 50k connector road. This is a typical example here of a photograph uh, of uh, that scenario. Again, your, your likelihood would be unlikely, but your severity would be looking at uh, major, which would give you an outcome of a, a medium risk rating. Down the bottom, where we have our um, 50k main street. So again, there's a photograph there where we're basically looking at very um, heavy um, pedestrian usage. So we're looking there at the likelihood would be very likely. Severity looking at um, would be major. And so that would give you an overall risk rating of being high. So from that, you, you get your risk. Um, so whether you're low, medium, and you're, and, or you're high. So basically, if you have that from your risk matrix, then what, what you actually do. So the, the guidance document uh, gives um, guidance on what you do in each of those scenarios. So if, if you're in the low uh, risk rating, basically it's acceptable to install uh, the appropriate stand, standard uh, TTM. You proceed with the works and you monitor as required. If you're in a medium uh, risk rating, which is where the that would uh, concentrates a, a, a lot of the um, guidance on. So there's action required. You need to install the TTM layout as per the in the low risk scenario, but you need to look at additional controls. If you're in the high scenario, high risk, then it, you need to go and talk to your TTM designer. There's input required from them, and you're looking at site specific um, plan is, is, is required. These additional controls, so <clears throat> again, there's 3D graphics used in the document, and um, just for the target the artist being the TTOS, just the examples here. So on the top left hand side, where we have the additional um, sign is included um, due to the road geometry. So basically, in, in this scenario here, the, the sign is restricted um, yeah, on the visibility. So for basically on this side, it looks at where the additional sign is included because of that. On the top right hand side, where we have the signage is in, is in place. So what, what has happened is that the number of cars have parked in that scenario um, after the TTM was put in place. So the blue arrow here looks at where that signage would be relocated due to the parked cars. On the bottom, what we have is basically on the left hand side is we have a, a daytime layout showing the uh, requirements for uh, a traffic uh, signals operation. Um, so then at night time, that operation transforms into so basically it's a, it's all stripped back um, and it, it transforms from a traffic signals operation into <coughs> into road narrows. So there's just some of the examples on the additional controls. Traffic control methods. So there's traffic control methods for uh, all the different areas. Um, so I think Aidan had one uh, on screen earlier. So this is just a typical example for a priority um, where we have an introduction. Um, uh, you have a standard layout, you have design parameters on the bottom. You're also looking at the summary criteria. On the second, on the back of the sheet, you have um, the priority visibility, looking at the inwards, and then you're looking at the installation and removal in the step by step process. So <clears throat> these are simply uh, two page summaries at the um, back of the, each of the parts of the document. So when the, you've gone out to the different stakeholders, so there has been quite, very good feedback on, on those. Moving on to part two. So again, this is uh, the TTM process for part two roads. These are the rural roads. Again, as I said, this is a flow chart that goes through the, the different steps. Uh, step one, uh, again, with the SOP, if you have it, you, you use that. Um, step two being your, where you're assessing your road site. Um, the road layout, you're looking at the visibility, speed, uh, what, what type of road it is. Uh, you're looking at your traffic count. Um, you're looking at your road width. Um, <clears throat> then at the next step, you're, you're assessing the traffic count. Um, looking at traffic volume, where if it's above the count that uh, that's required, then you need to go to your TTM designer. Um, and then it's step four being assessing the works to be undertaken. 
the time required, or the un unobstructed road width, um, the, the length of the works, etc. And um, we're looking at the, the time, whether it's greater than uh, the, the 15 minutes or less than 15 minutes, is it greater than 12 hours, less than 12 hours. And then here on the right hand side, um, we have the, the next steps where you're selecting your traffic management itself and the uh, two way traffic signals, uh, whether non stop marshalling. Um, there, there are all the different options that you'd have. And then step six and seven being where you're implementing and monitoring the, the works on site. Again, the part two looks at some of the principles and methodologies. Um, the, here are just some examples of signage installation and visibility. This photograph here, uh, typical rural um, scenario where we have uh, our WK001 sign is in place. It's a uh, narrow road, the vegetation is obscuring the sign. So that's uh, X used there that that's not would be uh, required. So again, here we have um, a tick box here where we have same sign, but it, the vegetation in front of it is is removed just to to improve the visibility to the sign. Just uh, some more examples. Another example here on the right hand side. This is a, a typical uh, probably regional road um, where we have the WK001 sign on the inside of the bend. Uh, it's pretty much obscured. So what you do in that scenario, you basically bring that bring that, that sign forward um, just to, to improve in, in the visibility to the sign. And then that, again, that's the using as the excellent and a green tick um, just for simplicity. Part two looks at the static operations. So it looks at uh, <coughs> operations at junctions and roundabouts. Um, looks at operations on narrow roads. So where the unobstructed road width is less than 2.5 meters gives guidance on the two scenarios where the works can't be suspended easily and guidance where the works can be suspended. So that's a typical example here of the local road where the width, the width available would be less than 2.5 meters. <coughs> um, so part two, the rules also looks at other static operations such as switching between phases, looks at um, railway crossings, gives guidance on all the traffic control methods uh, such as traffic signals, priority, all stop, uh, two-way, um, convoy, etc. So it looks, it looks at all those and then gives the two page summaries at, at the back. It also looks at the uh, SSOs, the semi-static operations, and the wide single carriageways. So again, where the unconstructed road width is greater than or equal to 2.5 meters. So that's a photograph there on the right hand side of a typical uh, probably re regional road where the width available would be greater than 2.5 meters. My, minor roads where the width is less than 2.5 meters. So again, down here on the bottom right hand side is a photograph of a typical scenario where that would be um, less than 2.5 meters where they have a, a local, typical local road um, where the width would be of that order. It also looks at wide single carriageways. So the, the, these are carriages where the, the lane widths are greater than 3.65 meters. So there was no guidance essentially up to now on, on the, those areas. So this is a typical example. Uh, there's a photograph here. Oh, where we have lane widths well in excess of 3.65 meters, and also in this scenario we have um, a hard shoulder, um, which is wide enough, effectively in this scenario, acting as a lane for hard road taking. So uh, there is guidance on, on those um, in, in the in the guidance document. Looking at specific operations, so um, <coughs> some so, some items would look at um, either static or semi-static layouts depending on the type of works. So they include items such as surface racing, road marking works, and traffic sign works. So there's uh, guidance on, on each of those scenarios. Again, then the, these are the um, traffic control methods. So these are the, in the two-page summaries. This is an example here of a stop and go operation. Again, where we have our introduction at the top, uh, typical um, layout in the middle of the first page, the ramp is on the bottom. On the second page, we have the summary criteria, the lane, lane widths, um, and then down the bottom we have the step-by-step -step installation and removal and in this scenario we have also we have the operation um, of the stop and go which is the additional on, on this one so it gives step-by-step um, -step guidance on, on each of those items. Moving on to uh, part three these are the, this is the high-speed network um, for dual carriages and motorways so the start of the part three um, looks at the different hazards um, so again, uh, on part three, uh, uh, the high-speed network, um, we're looking at 
the hazards are basically where there's much higher speed looking at 80, 100, 120 kph roads. Um, and in those scenarios as well on the high speed network, the uh, driver behavior is, um, is quite different. And you know, if somebody um, you know, sees, sees the road as a head sign, their general reaction is to basically try and speed up and, and get ahead of the truck ahead of them. They can before any lane closure comes, comes, comes along. So that's the, kind of the general driver behavior out there in a lot of cases. So that's um, so it goes through hazards such as that. It also gives um, <coughs> guidance and uh, requirements for the vehicles and equipment. So it, it looks at the um, traffic management vehicles, um, advanced warning vehicles, and the uh, IPVs, the impact protection vehicles. So it gives guidance on, on, on each of those and the requirements on what each of the vehicles actually, uh, what they have to have in place. <coughs> um, this is the flow chart for the um, static operations. So again, it's similar to part one and part two. So where we have um, step one being the SOPs, uh, if you have that, you use it, then moving on to the different steps after that, where you assess your traffic volume, uh, you have your three minute count, um, you assess the time required, uh, you're, you're looking at the planning, the TTM operation, you're looking at the location, the works type, uh, the works area requirements, traffic speed, um, so you're, you're looking at your briefing your crew. So you're looking at items such as the uh, risk assessments, the, the SS uh, safe system of work. You're looking at your plan. Um, then on the right hand side, where we have um, a step over here. So basically, that's the guidance document goes into a lot of detail on each of those steps. So again, on the flow chart here, it's color coded where basically. The signs that are put in place for each step are in red, and signs that are already in place at that point are in this um, yellow color. So again, it's color code just for simplicity, and it goes through each, each of those in, in some detail. Um, after that, it's the installation and, uh, and your inspections afterwards. From the bottom here in the uh, brown boxes where we have uh, <coughs> some of the applications of the statics, so we're looking at Arch all the closures, um, lane one closures, direct lane one closures, multi lane closures, merges, diverges, arch all the running narrow lane systems. So they've been touched on already in, in, there by Aiden earlier on. So it gives uh, guidance on each of those applications as well. This is our um, <coughs> just a, an example of the, the lead in taper um, installation. So this is our 180 taper um, that has been uh, spoken about already, or Christmas tree um, effectively. So the okay. guidance goes through in step-by-step -step guidance on how you actually install it. So <clears throat> this is where we have our IPV is basically 50 to 100 meters on the start of the taper. Um, we have our uh, <coughs> octaves here to install, uh, but then there are uh, three, three cones here on the, on the lane two. <coughs> After that, so they're working from the end of the taper back to the start of the taper. So they're putting out um, cones at the three meter uh, spacings on the uh, center median side and 12 meter cone spacings out on the on the line marking side, so they they're working backwards, then back to the start of the taper. The operatives are installing additional cones here um, at the for the for the block line of cones as they proceed by, by back to the start of the taper. Um, step four, looking at that again, where basically we have our 180 tapers installed, and our Christmas tree effect, where we have our black black one here, the 36 meter centers. Our IPV is after moving over to the hard shoulder. Um, and when it gets to the point where the longitudinal cone run is, is of sufficient length, then the IPV uh, can, can put into to that location. So that's just an example of the, um, the type of guidance that's in the document um, on, the, on the lead in uh, taper for the, the 180 taper. <laughs> These are the uh, <coughs> flowchart here for the mobile operations. So again, um, step one being the SOP. Um, if you have it, you, you, you use that. Step two being the uh, looking at the equipment checks. So you're checking the um, all your vehicles and whether they have is everything working. You're looking at the beacons, the um, boards, the signs, lamps, um, the light sensors. You're looking at um, <coughs> the communication equipment. So all those items are come under that step already. Everything is, is checked. You're then you're planning your mobile operation itself. So you're selecting the um, <coughs> You're selecting the standard lane closure layout, looking at the location and the link and the type of works to be undertaken, and um, how long it's going to take, what lane is going to be closed. Um, after that, you're looking at after you're planning uh, for the operation done, you're, you're brief your TTM and your works crew. 
So that's the next step down here. So you're looking at um, <coughs> items such as risk assessments um, for the works to be undertaken, the um, safe system of work, um, it, looking at items such as method statements would be included in that, in that step, um, looking at the, uh, <coughs> the works crew, the supervisors, um, assembly points, communications. So all those items would be looked at in step four. Um, on the right hand side is the step five. So <coughs> again, the step by step um, process here on how you actually carry out the mobile lane closures. Um, this is just the, the flow that gives a brief summary of it, but then the guidance itself um, goes into detail on, on, on each of those. <coughs> just to highlight one point, which is important on the, on the mobiles, which is the traffic volume. It's been alluded to already on the importance of that. So basically, if the traffic volume um, exceeds the permissible level, then you need to stop. So that's sort of color coded here with the, box, with the box here. So the lane closure, if, if it goes above um, the levels, um, the, the lane closure will have to be removed. On the bottom right hand side here, we, where we have some of the applications um, for the mobile operations. So items such as the hard shoulder closure and um, the mobile lane one closure, um, the mobile lane two, lane three closures, and multi lane closures. So <laughs> there are some of the uh, of the applications that are you can go that we went in, in, in detail on the operations um, guidance document. <clears throat> so these are just two, two examples here of the uh, some of the applications. There's um, the one on the left hand side is a 3D image of a mobile lane one closure on a two lane carriageway. So where we have basically we have our IPV IPV on lane one. We have our trailers. So we have our uh, trailer one one kilometer trailer. The trailer at the 600 meters and then trailer at the uh, 300 meters. The example on the right hand side is is a mobile lane three closure on a three lane carriageway. So again, where we have our uh, our IPV is out here on lane three, then we have our uh, trailers again as before, um, our trailer at one kilometer, 600, and the trailer at, a, at 300 meters. So again, similar to uh, <coughs> uh, the, the other products, uh, the 3D graphics, uh, where possible, are used in the operations just for, for simplicity. <coughs> this is a, an example of a mobile lane two closure on a two lane carriageway with the lead pilot vehicle. So this is a Typical scenario that you'd have on the high-speed network. So what we have is basically there's edge blocking operations take, taking place. Uh, we have our trailers here. We have the one, one kilometer, uh, the 600, and the 300 trailer. So we have our IPV uh, is out here. Um, then in front of the IPV, between 50 to 100 meters, um, we have our um, tractor doing, doing the works. And then in front of that, um, carrying the, uh, the deep left arrow is the lead pilot vehicle. And the lead pilot vehicle would be um, no greater than 100, 100 meters in front of the IPV. So that's a, a typical example there of um, hedge cutting, which would, which for the marks and the PPPs would be a typical um, operation that they'd be carrying out on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a brief summary of the operations guidance. So the basically, as I said, it so it outlines how to uh, install, maintain, modify, and remove TTM. Um, and it lo looks at guidance and uh, provides clear step-by-step -step guidance on again, the important term is um, on how you carry out TTM operations safely um, for all interested parties. So that's a brief summary of the <coughs> operations guidance. Thanks. Yeah, you should be glad to know this is the last presentation and it's a short presentation and it's just going to do a quick uh, recap or a quick um, talk about the training requirements that the, all this new documentation is going to introduce. So um, this morning all I think uh, every single talk to my recollection talked about risk and talked about the, the new documents take a risk-based approach rather than a, a, a design-based approach or design standard approach and really what that means is that where appropriate um, for example, in housing estates whereby the risks associated with traffic because of speed are small, then the controls that we select for that um, risk should co could correlate with that, correspond with that, because by putting in too big controls or too many controls, all that is doing is introducing new risks and new hazards into the site, so it should correlate with that. But likewise, where risks are 
are big, for example, on our motorway network or where we've uh, got operatives out working in lane two, we may have to use large forms of control, such as, for example, impact protection vehicles that Stephen was talking about. Now, these impact protection vehicles get struck. They get struck on a semi-regular basis. So we know that these are hazards themselves, but the fact is that, that what it's mitigating justifies the use of that. So, so this, that's what this risk-based approach means. So what does that mean now for us trying to implement these standards in terms of training? Well, the reality is who makes the decision? Who makes the decision? What, what is the risk? What, what control should be selected? Does it mean that we all need to now go to university and become professors of risk assessment, or do we need to, to become doctors of, of uh, hazard, hazard controls, etc.? Well, the reality, the answer to that is actually competence. Okay, it's competent people have to make that decision. That means that as employers or people involved in the industry, we have to have competent people who are designing the systems, competent people who are supervising the systems, and competent people who are t uh, undertaking the actual operations themselves. Well, what does competence mean? Okay, or how does it how does it uh, interact with the actual risk? Well, clearly. As the risk level of what we're doing increases, what it means is that the corresponding level of the competence, either of the designer or of the supervisor, Aidan talked about it in relation to the works that's actually been undertaken, well, as the, as the, as the risks increase, then the level of competence needed to, to deal with that risk also needs to increase. But likewise, for lower risk situations, then clearly the level of competence that's required doesn't have to be as demanding. So, for example, the the uh, watering the flower boxes at the side of the road or doing street sweeping, etc. They don't. The, the level of risk isn't the same as, let's say, taking an operation on a lane two of a very busy road. So, the level of competence required for that is correspond corresponds. But then, what does this term competence mean? Well, competence is actually talked about in legislation, and it's quite universally understood as training knowledge and experience. These are three terms that we commonly use for competence. Training is easily understood. Have you done CSCS SLG? Have you done a traffic management design course? Experience is also easily understood because it is how long have you been doing this for? I've been doing this for 12 years. Well, we can easily understand experience. Sometimes the term that isn't as easily understood is the term knowledge because it gets mixed up with training and it gets mixed up with experience because, well, if you've been working there longer, surely you know more about it. Well, in the terms of the competence that we're discussing here today and in terms of safety, knowledge is really knowledge of the hazards that are present and the controls that should be used. That's what makes you competent for that task. So do you know what safe operating procedures that your organization uses? Do you know what the safety management system is? And specifically here today, which is what we're all talking about, is knowledge of the fact is there is new standards now. The old standards are ceasing to exist. So you need to know that's the knowledge. That these, are the, these are the new controls that we're talking about. So it's that mix. So now when we apply that there to our risk assessment and our balance beam, we know that as the risk increases, then specifically it's either the training needs to increase, the knowledge needs to increase, or the experience needs to, to increase to match that level of risk. So that means that, yeah, that as the risk increases, maybe a less experienced colleague, maybe a, a more... A, or somebody who's newer into the industry and doesn't isn't as familiar with the safe operating procedures will require more training. Specifically here today, as so we talked about in terms of the increased level of knowledge, like up until now and to the June and, 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 and further afield, it means specifically that whoever's oper operating out in the sector needs to know about what these new standards are. That means existing people who have already been trained need to know what these new standards are. And then also, depending on the, the level of risk, clearly, and Aidan talked about this here, the level of experience should be, uh, should be to the scale and the scope of the tasks that are being undertaken. But who decides that? Well, again, that's specified. It's the employer. It's up to the employer to decide, well, what is the ratio of training, knowledge, and experience that a person needs. And, and the, the, to be quite honest with you and quite frank with you, the employer can decide, well, see, well actually, um, 
Jim there was designing my traffic management for the past 20 years. He's been doing a great job. I've t we've taken, we've put him on a few uh, seminars and stuff about getting, making, making sure that he knows about the update. And I'm, I'm confident, I'm quite happy that Jim is confident because I'm taking into account his balance of training, knowledge, and experience. So it is a matter for the employer to decide that. However, in the documents, there is um, words used, and Aidan showed a table there about the shoulds. About, and, and what it's trying to do in the document, it's not trying to tie anybody down or eliminate anybody who's doing a perfectly good job at the minute and is perfectly competent at the minute, but what it's trying to do is set a baseline for employers that they can judge, well, what is this mix? What should be the mix of training? What should be the mix of knowledge? What should be the mix of experience that a person has to undertake those? Also in the document, um, the, I think the third statement in the document states that the primary goal of the new documents is to ensure that all road users coming across Roadbrook site, uh, they come across a consistent message, a consistent way of dealing with it, so that they are familiar with how they react or how they behave when they come onto a Roadbrook site. Well, the Department of Transport is applying the same logic to training. And that means effectively that any training provided should be accredited training. Now, you can talk to your existing provider, and there is no promotion here of any, 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 any individual provider, but you talk to your existing provider about their accreditation status in, in, in relation to effectively the QQA that's here in Ireland. Okay? So just... so. The only thing that, that I suppose that you, to be aware of is that the, t that the book does talk about accreditation when it talks about training. There are obviously some prescribed training courses. One, uh, two of those in specific is uh, CSCS Sign Lighting and Guarding at Roadworks and CSCS Health and Safety at Roadworks. These are, these are individual specifically named courses. These are the only specifically named courses that are actually in the legislation. So CSCS Sign Lighting and Guarding, Stephen covered has to be undertaken by the TTOS if they're in charge of them installing, modifying, and removing equipment on the road. Now, to be, bear in mind, CSCS comes under construction regulations, and it also, the sign lit and garden, kicks in when the works affect the roadway or where we're diverting pedestrians or other vulnerable road users into the roadway. If either of those two things don't, don't, don't apply, then somebody who's been very pedantic could say, well, actually, I don't need CSCS sign lit and garden. However, again, this is an organization level decision. And the reason I'm, I'm pointing that out to you is, has anybody ever passed a hedge cutter? And what is the level of signage that these hedge cutters use? <coughs> is it good? Is it poor? Is it bad? It's generally fairly bad, okay, unless a road authority is providing it for them. Now, the reason for that is, and by the way, to be very, very clear about this, in all circumstances, if you're working on a road, whether you're surveying the road, whether you're cleaning a sign face, whether you're hedge cutting, or whether you're digging it up and resurfacing it, Chapter 8 always applies. And the layouts that we talked about this morning always apply. But that hedge cutter isn't doing that because the hedge cutting man doesn't know. He doesn't know what he doesn't know because he hasn't got the training. So when your organization comes along, they're going to fix that, but they're going to find that balance with, well, actually, yeah, strictly speaking, this may not be construction, or strictly speaking, we may not be affecting the road, but I still want my people trained, either in CSCS, sign out and garden road, as I said, where it's, where it's affecting the roadway and you're putting out, installing, or modify, uh, removing devices, and CSCS Health and Safe Roadworks at all other times where one person on the site must be present, must be present during construction works. For motorway training, uh, the book talks, splits these into different types of operations. We have static operative, mobile operative, and IPV driver. So in terms of the competence level and the training programs to provide for that, they should be geared towards those activities in line with what the book actually prescribes. But likewise, there is, a, there is a, an, an additional, um, I suppose, training or competence level alluded to in the book, but it's not specified. Uh, and that is the level of supervisor. Stephen here talked about if somebody is supervising a static operation on a road work, the book does state that, yes, that person must have CSCSSLG and should have the static operative 
qualification because that's an accreditation to say yes there's a certain standard has been achieved there but like but saying as it's up to the employer to decide well maybe the scale of works is such like that they need a higher level of qualification again and the supervisor so that's really an employer decision uh, in that regard in terms of designer training the book states that you should have a level six engineering or safety qualification that's a level six again this is all qqi referenced and again should have an accredited traffic management design qualification and really and truly it breaks that into two tasks as well a level one and two roads and level three roads and lastly the new um or it's not that new but maybe new to some people as on the release of the books as inspector and auditor training and again what it's saying there is that you should have a level six engineering or safety qualification you should have an accredited traffic management design qualification or the specific traffic management auto qualification now this really only affects clients uh, this is really talking about clients if you're a contractor and auditing your own stuff then this that's not what this section of the book is talking about this section of the book is talking about the client in other words the road authority or the statutory undertaker who's actually engaged in the work because the key thing about this new requirement as Aidan actually talked about was the fact is that this traffic management designer and that traffic management operative for the supervision and the operations is actually the design of it is coordinated by the PSDB. So the purpose of this is to get the PSDB back in the loop for the traffic management. In other words, that it doesn't fall to, oh, that was the, that shucks, that contractor, what are you going to do? All right. That the responsibility is coming back, that it's saying that actually this is a PSDP role this audit role, if the traffic management isn't up to scratch, something has to be done about it. Now, because of that, you, there is an additional acknowledgement that, remember we talked about the mix about training, knowledge and experience, that this person, this auditor, because in, a, in, a, in essence, that auditor may be out at a time where there's nobody else there to make a decision, where the decision may be that, well, actually, this is very, very dangerous. I need to shut this down now. Or something needs to happen now what is it that needs to happen? And because of that, there is an, an, uh, there's a larger onus on experience on that person to have, to, to have known what has worked in the past, what has not worked in the past. So as opposed to the, the designer who effectively can design out of the box, there is a requirement here that this auditor should have seven years postgraduate experience or five years, uh, five years of which should be working on road design, construction, or traffic management. So, in terms of uh, the the programs that are that are that are out there now at the minute, like clearly, clearly there needs to be a knowledge update. Now, again, there's no prescription here about how that knowledge update happens. Some people may be dealing in lower risk type activities may decide, well, listen, we'll take care of our own knowledge updates. And Aidan always talked about, well, like if you've got a good competent designer, you could give them a set of books, say go away for a couple of days and come back and read that. It's up to the employer to decide whether they're happy with that. Um, maybe a case that you get in contact with your existing training provider and you say to them listen we're looking for an update program you make inquiries well is the is your programs accredited have you any sort of way of assuring me that that what you're going to provide me with is actually meets the requirements so uh, uh, you can have those conversations yourself but um sorry just and but just in relation to that an important point that that Solis did want to point out is that their three-day CSS SLG and one-day health and safety roadworks is for new entrants only. They will not permit people to sit on any CSCS program, not just traffic management, on any CSCS program as a refresher, including logs or anything like that there. So they're for new entrants only. To revise your, to renew your ticket, you do not need to go under any update training or anything like that there. As far as Solace is concerned, what you do is you pay your 32 euro 